In my sophomore year of high school, a close friend of mine was murdered. Going back, freshman year when I was in homeroom, I became friends with the girl who sat right in front of me. Her name was Deanna Wright. We came from the same neighborhood and both worked at pizza shops a few blocks away. One night, I remember she texted me, asking if I wanted to go do something together. This was way before everyone had unlimited cell phone plans. I had the Nokia that was basically just a brick, and I had to pay for every minute we used to text. If it was short, we could get away with not having to open it, and therefore being charged the five cents per minute. She told me she'd had a fight with her mother, and felt like going out and smoking some weed. I had to work and wouldn't be done until close to 1am. Since I needed some gas money, I told her I couldn't blow off work that night, but I might come out and hang out with her afterwards. She grumbled and said okay, and to text her when I was done with work to see where she was at, because she couldn't decide what she was going to do yet. At 1.15, as soon as I got off, I texted her, but I didn't get a reply. No big deal, I thought. Probably she just went to sleep. So Saturday, I text her again. Nothing. Sunday. Nothing. Again, I thought she was probably just grounded. That's why she'd been mad to begin with. She was grounded, went out, got grounded again, left and went out again. That's how it usually went. Monday, though, when I came into school, I heard the teacher make a sudden announcement. Sorry to inform you guys, but Deanna is missing. Her family reported her missing after she left. She went out and never came home, so if you know anything, please contact the police. And the teacher said all of this in a despondent tone. My stomach dropped instantly. My fingers tingled. I couldn't believe it. Apparently, that night she ended up hanging out with a guy she'd met working at the pizza shop. Everything was going alright at first. She was a beautiful girl, she was a model, so we all know what he was thinking. We're not sure how things exactly went down. But we know she was drugged, reared, and strangled. Then her vile murderer decided to cut her body into small pieces, put her in a steel drum, and light her on fire. Every day, I think about that night over and over. Should I have gone with her? Would that really have made any difference? Or would he simply have killed us both? Her father was an FBI agent, so it truly goes to show that if someone is evil and wants to kill you, then nothing and I mean not a single thing, will be able to get in their way. In the spirit of Halloween, I'll share an incident that happened to me last October. It was 10 a.m. on a weekday, and I had the day off. So, I decided to go to the grocery store and get some pumpkins to carve. I did my shopping with no problems and didn't notice anything off since it was earlier in the day and the other shoppers were all elderly. I didn't suspect anything would be either. I bought three large pumpkins and had them in a cart to put in the trunk of my car. As I was putting the first large pumpkin inside, holding it with one arm and opening the trunk with the other, with my back to the parking lot, I felt someone tug the pumpkin out of my arm backwards. I spun around right away and threw that pumpkin in the process, only to see two men now directly behind me. I'm a very small woman, so immediately I felt in danger. The one man, who I assume must be the one who first grabbed at me, made an attempt to scream something at me in a language I didn't understand. He grabbed me once again. I pushed the cart with the remaining pumpkins at the two men as hard as I could and hopped in my car to lock the doors and drive away. As soon as I'd gotten the car going, the two men jumped into a white, brand new Dodge Charger with temp plates and sped out of the parking lot right after me. The street we pulled out onto was a busy four-lane business district. You couldn't safely speed through this. That didn't matter to them, though, as they weaved in and out of traffic to try and run me off the road. Their driving was so erratic that another driver even attempted to box the charger in themselves. It didn't matter much anyway. They simply went into oncoming traffic to follow me. Meanwhile, I threw on my left turn signal and made a quick turn into a donut and coffee chain I regularly frequented. 
next to this coffee chain was a pizza shop that was not yet open. I noticed the charger had pulled into the pizza chain and was waiting for me to pull out of the coffee chain parking lot. I frantically told the employee what was going on through the drive through window while I ordered a snack. Really, I was just waiting in the drive through because I didn't want to pull out yet. The coffee chain knew me very well, and on this day, the manager went above and beyond the call of duty. She called the police for me, who told her to have me pull around to the window. She did so, knowing I would be in full view of the charger. Because of this, she came outside to stand in between us with the biggest rolling pin I'd ever seen in my life. She stared those men down like my own mother would have. The cops came swiftly and took statements from all of us. The charger, surprisingly, was still there. The police searched it. One officer told me they'd pulled tarp and rope from the trunk and were now treating this as a trafficking attempt or something. Both men refused to answer any questions and were promptly arrested. I don't know for sure what their intent was, but I live in a sanctuary city, mostly with people from Nepal or Bhutan, and I've never had a scary issue before. I love my neighborhood and the people in it, but I didn't recognize these men, nor their car frequenting the neighborhood ever before. That day, I bought everyone working at that coffee chain a gift certificate for a nice fancy massage as a thank you for protecting me. I still tip them every morning with extra, even a year later. To start with, my parents have always taught me to be very independent. I live 30-ish minutes away from New York City by train, so I was taught not to be afraid of the subway systems. I learned very quickly how to find my own way around New York City and my town in Jersey via public transportation. I always checked in with my parents as well, whether I was going to practice or to a movie with my friends. It didn't really matter. I made sure to always check in, so it was never really a big deal. Anyway, a few weeks prior to the incident I'm about to talk about, the internet in our house was not working. I needed the computer to finish a research paper. Since the library was closed, it was a weekend, so this was typical of my town. My older brother took me to this internet cafe a few blocks away from our house. While there, my brother was talking to his friend Charles and introduced us both to each other. Well, little did I know that this Charles guy, who was only about 17 years old, was about to shortly save my life. Oh, I almost forgot an important detail. The cafe was on the main street of my town, and there was a bus stop about a block away from it. A few weeks after meeting Charles, my friends invited me to go bowling in the city with them. My parents said it was fine. I was 14, so obviously I still had to ask for permission to go into the city alone. I was well on my way around noon. We bowled, grabbed some pizza, talked about my friend's new puppy, all the typical girl things. Everything was actually going really great. That was until I started making my way back home. At 3 p.m., there were some delays with the subway system. Instead of waiting it out there, I decided to try and take a different subway home. It would drop me off at the Newark Penn Station, and I would be one bus ride away from my home. No problem. Just a little detour. At 3.15 p.m., I got on that subway when I noticed an older man staring at me. It creeped me out, but that was nothing new in New York City. I simply tried my best to ignore him. At 3.50 p.m., though, I arrived at Newark Penn Station, and this man saw me get up to go. He made eye contact with me and smiled, then hurried to catch up behind me. Mind you, I was a young, small girl at this time, so I was a very easy target. He was being creepy, so I walked fast and tried to get lost in the crowd. The doors opened and I weaved my way in between people. This dude must have had like 40-40 vision or something because as soon as I arrived at my bus stop, I turned around only to see he was still right behind me. 4ish p.m., I'm sitting next to an elderly looking lady at the bus stop. The creepy dude was now pacing back and forth, about 10 feet away from me. He was looking at me unblinking pacing back and forth. Every part of my body was saying, run now, this man is bad news. 
Still, though, there was nowhere for me to go. At least sitting next to this kind older lady made me feel a little bit safer. I took my phone out to text my mom, only to realize it was dead. Wonderful. Thankfully, more people had now arrived at the stop, and I felt a lot better. There were now a lot of witnesses around. The man couldn't do anything, but he was still staring and pacing back and forth. At 4.15 p.m., the bus arrived finally. I quickly rushed in and sat as close as possible to the driver. I don't know why I didn't tell the bus driver what was happening. I guess I was young, scared, and naive, and didn't want to burden the driver with knowing this. Stupid. I know that now. My stop was the very last one. So I was thinking to myself, well, this guy has got to get off the bus before me. There's no way he's going to stay on till the very end just to follow me. Many, many, many stops later, the man was still on the bus. He was also doing this very creepy thing. Whenever the bus stopped, he would observe if I was going to get up with everyone else. And then when I stayed, instead of getting off the bus, he would scoot closer and closer to the front where I was. There were fewer and fewer people on, and I realized this guy was going to get off whenever I did. This meant that if I got off at my real stop, he would simply follow me home, find out where I lived, or maybe I'd never get home in the first place. At 5pm, there were now only two stops separating my house and I. This guy, a single lady, and I were the last ones inside the bus. I decided I was going to get out early, because there was no way I was going to let this guy know where I lived. I got off a stop early. He saw and followed me right away. I did my best to pick up speed, but he easily kept pace with me. I started running, only for him to start running after me. In my panic, I suddenly remembered that cafe. It would be closing soon, but I was only a single block away. I ran for my life to the cafe, with the guy right on my tail. As I was approaching... I saw Charles standing outside, just happening to be in the middle of locking up the place. He took one look at me and knew there was something wrong. I guess he could see the fear in my face and the older man running after me. I rushed over to Charles, who immediately pushed me inside the cafe and locked the door behind us. Luckily, he was fast on his feet and the creep had been locked outside. My heart was pounding. I told Charles this random man had been following me across three different towns, and I was extremely scared. He called the cops. The man was just staring inside the cafe. I was staring back at him, now protected by the locked yet clear glass door. I had to remember all his details. The creepy dude stared and smiled for a minute, then simply walked away as if nothing had ever happened. Little did me or the man know that Charles' uncle was a cop in our town. A few minutes later, the cops rushed in force. After describing the vivid details of the man, it only took them a minute to catch this creep still walking down Main Street. We later found out this creepy guy had a warrant out for his arrest for armed robbery and had prior accounts of sexual assault as well. Had it not been for Charles that day, I don't know what would have happened to me. I was really grateful to him for saving my life, and no, this did not deter me from public transportation or exploring the city alone. My parents did freak out a bit, of course, and bought me some mace and a taser. As an adult, I now travel all over the world, sometimes alone, but I'm always hyper aware of my surroundings, all because of what that man did at 14 years old. I'm an 18-year-old female living in a small town in Michigan. When this incident took place, I had been working a few hours a week at a small pizzeria. It was in my town and I had been working there for about a year when my boss decided to go on a vacation. She and her family lived in an apartment below the restaurant and two other apartments were situated above it. In order to get to these apartments, you had to go to the back of the building and down a sketchy set of stairs. There, down a further slope, you would find her door, and stairs leading up to the other apartments above. Beyond that, there was a yard, and then some woods. I think it's important to mention that there was absolutely no reason to be behind the restaurant 
unless you were trying to enter these apartments. Now, I usually worked with my mom because we got stuff done easily together and I hated answering phones. One night though, my mom was feeling ill, so I had to work with another lady. She was very sweet, but not exactly super efficient. This meant I was working a lot harder to keep up and getting a bit agitated when she told me we needed some Parmesan. I agreed to go grab it from the store just down the road if she promised not to make me answer the phones for the rest of our shift. There was only about two hours left anyway, and those were normally slow hours as well, so I didn't think it would really matter that much. As I was getting into my SUV, I saw a man pull into the small parking lot in a beat-up car and park near the back. He was lanky and wearing oil-stained shop clothes, which was and still is totally normal around here. He got out and retrieved a bag from his trunk, then started to head down those back stairs. I knew for sure this guy was not a renter because I'd never seen him before and the renters frequently ordered pizza. I guessed it was possible he was a friend of one of the renters, but something about this did not seem right. It was around 9.30 at night, and one of the renters was a single mom. The others were two brothers with mental health issues, and they were pretty antisocial to anyone they didn't know. I was getting bad vibes from this man. I grabbed my knife from the center console and tucked it into my sleeve. And call me paranoid, but there'd been a lot of car fires and break-ins around that time, so I was nervous to go anywhere unarmed. It might have been a stupid thing to do, but I genuinely considered my boss and the people that worked there my friends, and I didn't want this guy to hurt any of the renters or steal from any of the apartments either. I decided to sneak up and see what he was doing, just in case he was a man with ill intention. I got out of my car and walked quietly over. There were motion-activated lights, so I could easily see what the man was doing. He was fiddling with this old key ring and seemed to be trying to get into my boss's apartment. Hey, what are you doing? I asked loudly so my coworker could hopefully hear me through the open back door. The man was clearly startled. He smiled and told me he worked for my boss's husband and he was there to feed the dog and let it out. His smile was way too creepy though. It was the kind a liar gives when they're trying really hard to convince you. My boss did have a dog, and her husband did own a fabrication shop, so his story seemed to check out on a surface level, but something had me still not convinced. I decided to go get the cheese and check again when I went back. Okay, well, let me know if you need help with something. I tried to sound as normal as possible, but something was seriously weirding me out here. I hustled at the store and rushed back to work. I'd been gone about ten minutes and when I got back, surprisingly, he was already gone. I was still feeling something was off, though, and I was feeling bad for the dog who'd been shut in a good portion of the day. I decided to text my boss and let her know what was going on. Fast forward two hours, and I was now on my way home. I got to my door when I decided to check Facebook. As I was scrolling downwards, I saw something that made my stomach drop instantly. It was a picture of my boss with her dog at the beach from earlier that very day. I called my boss and then the police to file a report. It turned out the man had been fired by my boss's husband earlier that week for making an inappropriate comment about his underage daughter and repeatedly harassing other female staff. This guy had planned some sort of revenge scheme. Luckily, he didn't know their family had left for vacation. His bag was full of tools and knives. During questioning, he told them the only reason he'd left right away was because he thought I'd stayed behind to watch him. Thankfully, he went to jail soon after, and for a couple of other things he'd been wanted for previously. It still creeps me out to this day, and I hate to think what might have happened if their family had really been home. So I spend most of my summers in Australia, helping out on my uncle's farm. In the family, it's just him, my female cousin who's never home because of ballet school, and my male cousin. My brother and I were there last summer when I was 14. I got up in the morning and walked into the kitchen. 
seeing a dude underneath the computer desk. Oh, he's just fixing the computer, don't mind him. He'll be done in about an hour or so, my uncle told me. My brother and my cousin had gone surfing, while my uncle was going to pick something up from the store. I was getting weird vibes from this bloke I'd just been left alone with. He kind of vaguely looked like the guy from Smash Mouth, but with a patchier beard and much thinner hair. He kept on tinkering away at the computer, and I silently slinked back down the hall. I wanted some privacy. I opened my female cousin's bedroom door and walked in. I put her music on softly and left after I slammed the door. I then crept down the hall a little more into my cousin's room. I rolled underneath his bed and started messaging back and forth with my boyfriend back home. I let my boyfriend know what was happening. I was still weirded out because I'm inherently suspicious of any man or woman I don't know. We were making jokes to calm me down about him flying down here and beating this random repairman up. And that was when I began to hear footsteps echoing down the hall. Um, the bathroom was right next to the computer, and the only thing down here was all of our bedrooms. What could he possibly want here? I heard my female cousin's door open, and him skulking about inside. Since she had a laminate floor, I could hear him walking around. Her bathroom door creaked open. I heard him pull it open and begin searching around, then eventually leave the room. He was definitely looking for something, or for someone. My cousin's door then creaked open, and I heard him step inside the room I was currently hiding in. Thankfully, my cousin had a lot of shit under his bed, so the man was not able to find me. The man was muttering to himself as he opened the bathroom, the closet, and even searched under the dresser. Then he left again, walking all around the house. I was definitely freaked out at this point, but it started to get way worse. A car pulled up outside out of nowhere. It didn't have the familiar sound of my uncle's truck either. All of a sudden, the man's phone rang, and he picked it up. Nah, man, I can't find her. I think she left or something. There was a brief pause as I began to furiously message my boyfriend, thoroughly and utterly spooked. Fine, fine, but they're gonna be back any minute, so you gotta move fast. I couldn't believe this was happening. A bunch of people entered the house. I couldn't tell how many footsteps I heard, but I learned later it was two different sets. Stupidly, I rolled out from under the bed so I could grab the phone on my cousin's nightstand. I couldn't use mine because it was a Canadian phone, and fuck roaming charges, you know? I was about to dial 911 when I had that sudden realization. Oh fuck man, I'm in a different country. What's the number for the police? Basically, I'm holding this pizza-shaped phone, thinking, oh shit, when three men walk into the room. More repair guys? I asked them, trying very hard to play dumb. At this moment, my boyfriend was messaging me like mad, because I just sent him a text, about to call 911. I might die, so if I do, delete my internet history for me. I hadn't messaged him back since. I was holding that phone, looking pale and shaky. That obviously is not good, because they knew I knew what they were up to. They filed into the room, and I've never been more glad to hear. What the fuck are you doing? My brother rushed in soaking wet, holding a surfboard and looking very menacing. These dudes were all cornered as hell. They started making excuses, and by the time their sorry asses were done trying to explain why they trapped a scared-looking teenage girl in a bedroom all alone, my overprotective uncle showed up holding a bag of milk and some frozen curly fries. He flipped his shit and began beating them with the fries. Long story short, I almost got terrorized by three older men. But in the end, thanks to my brother and uncle, they ended up looking like a child with purple and red crayons had gotten bored and drawn all over them. I work as a pizza jockey, aka a delivery boy, in my spare time. The other day, an order was made. We live in a pretty small town, which only really has a McDonald's and a Pizza Hut, considering the Pizza Hut is located at the shopping center, which is basically smack dab in the middle of town. 
we delivered pretty much everywhere within the town's limits. And if we had the time, we'd go out to the local farms as well. Now, I would always handle the in-town deliveries, but I worked later than the pizza jockey who handled the farms, so sometimes I would have to deliver to those farms very late at night. There was recently a local ad for an outside room for hire at one of the farms, which also happened to be my friend's farm. Shortly after, someone hired the room, and we got a delivery from that place. To no one's surprise, I was the one who had to deliver. When I got there, it was completely quiet, eerily so. I texted my friend to see what was going on. I asked them where they were, only for them to tell me they had all gone into town to visit the local swimming pool. The only people that were supposed to be on that farm were me and the people who'd hired the outside room. I go over to the door. I knock. No answer. I call out to whoever might be there. Hey, your pizza's here. Still no answer. In the very next instant, all I could see was pure white. Someone had been hiding behind the wall, and they sprayed talcum powder, of all things, directly into my eyes. I stumbled backward and tried to rub my eyes clean. In the process, I dropped the pizza. The man grabbed it and rushed into his car, a red Toyota. I was extremely confused and disoriented. I decided I needed to get into my car and drive away as fast as possible. I had no idea what was going to happen if I stayed there. As my engine started up, I could hear his do so as well. The man started to follow me. My eyes were still sore and blurry. I rushed my way to the police station. As soon as he saw I was en route to the police, he took a sharp turn in another direction. The next day, I told my boss about what happened, and he kind of freaked out at me for losing a pizza. Then he said he was glad I was okay. I called my friend, telling him that guy was crazy and soon the poster for the outside room was up again. The pizza thief had been kicked out. Yeah, he really thought he would get away with that. My eyes were still itching even a couple of days later. The guy was soon under arrest in the police station for a couple of weeks, after which he moved out of town shortly after. I'll provide a bit of background for everyone. I'm currently 29 and female, and this took place when I was 14 years old. I had just started 8th grade, actually. I grew up in southeast Texas, and as I'm sure many of y'all know, fall is still pretty much part of hurricane season. It was a Friday night, and it was just me and my mother at home. My dad was out of town for work. I originally had some plans to go spend the night at a friend's house but there was a tropical storm coming in, and my mom decided last minute that she would rather have me at home that night. I was pretty damn pissed, of course. Tropical storms weren't normally looked at too seriously. I honestly felt like she was overreacting. Of course, this was my I'm 14 and therefore a grown-up mentality at work here. Still, my mom did feel bad, so we rented a bunch of movies and ordered a pizza and got a bunch of ice cream for a great night in. My parents' bedroom was on the opposite end of the house from mine. This part is important for later. We lived in a split-level house. The house I grew up in was built in 1950 and was a post-modern style. Think Frank Lloyd Wright. The entire back part of the house was all floor-to-ceiling windows. Think of it as just a huge wall of glass. The entire house was an open floor plan, so the kitchen was the first defined room with walls on the first floor. My bedroom was directly off the kitchen, while my parents' room was at the top of the stairs. She had gone to bed around 10 p.m. I went off to my room to watch two movies I had rented just for myself. The storm was really starting to kick into high gear. The wind was picking up, and it was raining sideways. I was in the middle of watching The New Guy, and I still remember looking at my clock. It said 12.53 a.m. I was getting pretty tired, and I could feel my eyes getting heavy. With the weather so bad, I remember thinking that maybe it wasn't so bad that I'd missed the sleepover that night. At some point, I must have dozed off, though, because the next thing I remember was just hearing this huge crash. It was one of the big windows in either the dining room or living room. 
Our neighborhood was in a well-wooded area, and I thought that maybe a tree branch had fallen in the storm and broken the window. I left my room and went out to the kitchen. Right as I was approaching the doorway, from the kitchen to the dining room, I could see my mom coming down the stairs. At that very same moment, I saw a man standing in our dining room, covered in broken glass and blood. Due to where he was standing, I could not get to my mom. The man seemed to be young, early twenties, soaking wet and with no shoes on. I could see that he clearly just run through our window. He was bleeding all over, with glass sticking out of him at all parts, and was standing barefoot in the broken glass as well. It took him a second to register my mother and I. When he did though, he immediately launched into this explanation of how he was being chased by someone who wanted to kill him, and we needed to call the cops right now. My still fairly innocent 14-year-old brain didn't doubt this at all, but my mom was eyeing him quite suspiciously. We moved into the kitchen. My mom grabbed her purse and my arm to keep me close. I had grabbed a kitchen towel to try and help his bleeding. My mom pulled out her cell phone and started calling our neighborhood patrol. I noticed this, and so on our landline, I called 911. We finished both of our calls, and now we were just waiting. The man couldn't seem to sit still, and kept getting up and peeking through our kitchen windows, pacing back and forth. He didn't seem to notice he was cut up and bleeding everywhere. He was muttering under his breath. What happened next happened extremely fast, and became a bit blurry. All of a sudden, the doorbell rang. I assumed it was our neighborhood patrol that my mom had called. The doorbell immediately sent the man into a panic. He jumped up and sprinted and grabbed a hold of me. He had me in a chokehold, and my mom was now screaming to let me go. He was looking around frantically, pulling me through the dining room and the living room, back towards our stairs. The doorbell began to ring again. My mom was still following close, begging him to let me go. He now had me at the bottom of the stairs, and my mom had a choice to go to the front door to open it, or to follow him up with me. She ran for the door, just as he pulled me up the last of the stairs. I could hear our alarms start blaring. Normally, we arm it at night, so you would need to type in the code before going out the door. He pulled me into my parents' room. As soon as we got inside, he dropped me and started to freak out. He was saying something about all the lights, he began to smash all the lamps, and all the light bulbs as well, trying to get the lights to turn off. He was screaming that they were burning him. There was a small garden just off my parents' bedroom, and they had garden lights they turned on at night. He took up a chair and threw it at the glass door trying to smash it so he could get out and break those lights as well. At least, that's what it seemed like. Ag crawled into a corner to get away from him at this point. When he completely turned away from me, to grab another chair. I made a run for it. I sprinted down the stairs. The cops had made it into the house at this point and were at the bottom of the stairs with their guns drawn. One of them swiftly grabbed my arm and pulled me out of the way once I reached the bottom. They took me outside to an ambulance and my mom. My adrenaline was coming down now. When it hit me, what just happened? I started shaking and could feel a pain around my throat from where he'd been holding me in the chokehold. There was a ton of yelling and screaming from inside. About ten minutes later, the cops came out with the guy in handcuffs. When he saw me, he tried to lunge at me, which was terrifying. I had a bruised windpipe, but otherwise I was relatively okay. I learned later that the guy was 20 years old and a chemistry major at one of the universities in town. Together with some friends who were also chem students, they had made their own PCP. Now he had never tried PCP before, and he had a bad reaction. He had been driving to get some food, when he'd started acting paranoid and upset. At the drive through he insisted they let him out, and as soon as they did, he took off into the night. Apparently, thinking you're being chased is a common hallucination to have when you're on a bad trip of PCP. Light sensitivity is also a common side effect. He wasn't a bad kid. He'd never been in trouble before. He was a good student, pretty much the last person you'd think that would do something like this. Our house just happened to be the only one on our street that was not completely fenced off, and that's how he was able to reach the back and those windows. 
When I got older, it really hit me just how easy it is to become just like that kid. I had friends who wound up being chemistry majors and also DIY'd some of their own drugs. Thankfully, the night didn't end up worse because it definitely could have gone in an entirely different direction. It was late spring of my seventh year in school. It was a rough school in a sketchy area. It was my third year of middle school. I was in a program to better integrate classes. The enrollment for the program was fairly small, even smaller numbers for women, so making female friends in this isolated environment was difficult at best. That's when I met Sabrina. She wanted to have me and her friend Kylie spend the night, and I was absolutely thrilled. She lived in an apartment with her mother and brother that was across from a racetrack and a bar. Super sketchy area. Her mother apparently sold handmade keychains at the flea market each weekend. Things started to get weird about the time we ordered pizza and a movie. Her mother was a little bit odd and hung out the whole time like she was a 13-year-old girl, regularly going into her room and calling Sabrina back with her. We couldn't ask what was up because her mom was always there. This was the age of pagers. Finally, around 9 p.m., her mom went to bed. To our dismay, though, 10 minutes later, she called Sabrina to come to bed with her. Apparently, she was going to stay with her mom at her own damn sleepover. So, left with a couple of pillows that had seen better days, and no blankets or bedding at all, Kylie and I were going to have to have a sleepover by ourselves. We started the movie back up and tried to make the best of it when Sabrina came out to get the phone. As she was about to go back into the room, she whispered to us, Don't stay up too late now. We have to go to the flea market tomorrow and leave at 5.30. I guess she saw our faces. She did this creepy little laugh and said, You didn't think the pizza was free, did you? She then rushed into the room and locked the door behind her. Kylie, who I'd just met this evening, and I exchanged glances. This was the first we were hearing about this. We were never even asked. After a short conversation, we both decided we wanted to go home. Our parents were more likely to be awake now than early the next morning. We went to knock on the bedroom door to tell them we wanted to go home, only to be met with no answer. We tried again, but nothing. There was no way they were asleep that fast. I went to the kitchen to see if there was another phone. Nope. They've locked us in the living room of this one-bedroom apartment with no phone and no restroom, and now they refuse to respond to us at all. This is where the young and dumb us formulated a plan. We knew the school was not too far away. Kylie said she lived nearby, so we decided to find a payphone and walk to her house together. I mean, how bad could it be? Biggest mistake of our lives. We tried knocking one last time, only to be met with the same result. We gathered up our belongings and made a plan to leave. We snuck out through a window. How the world changed outside after 10 p.m. The bar, a stone's throw from the apartment, was absolutely jumping. We went up to the payphone that was near the street and close by the rear of the bar. Great. Just to our luck, it was broken. As I put the receiver down... This drunk, burly man rounded the corner towards us. We were two 13-year-olds, but we could have passed for 17 easy. Neither of us were dressed showing much skin, but the drunk dude apparently really liked what he saw. First, he yelled and asked if we wanted to party, or if he could buy us some drinks. No thanks, we replied, and started to walk in the direction of her home. This seemed to infuriate the man. He was now yelling that we were skanks, and nobody ever turned their back to him. We tried to keep moving on, only for him to stumble after us surprisingly quickly. He caught Kylie by the wrist. She was trying to shake him off, but he was much too strong. He started telling us what he was going to do to us. We were terrified, because she couldn't break his hold, and he refused to let go. And that's when I landed a shot right to his family jewels. We took off running but that must have sobered him up quite some bit because he got even angrier in his pursuit. We scanned the area, but there was no place to hide. 
no place to get help either, and we were now not trusting if we saw someone that might help us. The area had quite a few ladies of the night and other sketchy people. We ran back to loop around the apartment Sabrina lived in, but somehow one of Mr. Drunk's friends had joined his pursuit. We know he was behind us. He was alternating between telling us what he was going to do to us and yelling to his friend, saying there was one for each of them and to not let us get away. Now we were trapped. We booked it, much to my chagrin, up the metal stairs and onto the second floor. We started pounding on doors, but in that area, nobody was going to open their door past dark. Luckily, we found an open door at the very end. We were in the clear, or so we thought. I could hear the clink-clank of one of them coming up. The stairs had no second floor visibility, luckily. We dashed into the room, only to see it was a laundry room with no door to lock. We started wedging ourselves between the machines, praying and hoping we would not be found. The man was on the second floor and heading our way. Everything went quiet, except the distant voices and music from the bar. He didn't leave, I think. I didn't hear him going down the stairs, at least. That's when the aroma of alcohol and smoke descended upon the air. He was in the doorway, listening for us. I know you're in there, girls. There's nowhere for you to go now. If you come out, I'll forgive the bitch that kicked my nuts, and I'll go easy on you both. So come on out. After a moment, he spoke again, and his mood flipped once more. Okay, you fucking bitches. I'm gonna yank you out by your hair and... You get the idea. Rough like I like it. I'd love to say someone overheard all this and intervened, but of course, they did not. After what seemed like an eternity, he stood there for about 20 minutes before we heard him descend the stairs. We hid for another 15 before checking to see if it was safe to leave. Long story short, we made it to Kylie's house, which was not as close by as she'd said. Still though, we had our lives. My father came to get me after midnight. The next morning, Sabrina's mother called and feigned cluelessness as to why we would leave. She claimed we'd never knocked and lied about snatching the phone. She thought it was normal to make her daughter's friends work for free. Sabrina and I didn't speak much after, needless to say, and Kylie's parents believed all of Sabrina's mother's nonsense and grounded her for an entire month. This all happened such a long time ago but it still stays with me and haunts me to this day. This happened about six years ago, but first, a little bit of backstory. Back then, I was in university and lived about 10 hours away from my parents. It was a long drive, and our hometown was super boring, so I only ever visited for Christmas. That year, though, because I was going through a bad breakup, I decided to go home for the summer, wanting to just be lazy and sunbathe in my parents' garden with some trashy novels. Luck had it that my cousin, who lived next door, who was two years younger than me and basically like my sister, was also home visiting her mom. My parents had a big dog that looked pretty scary but was a gentle giant and a surrogate mother to our kittens. Anyway, I was home for a couple of months, and my parents were going on a holiday for about two weeks to the other side of the country. I was okay being home alone, although it was a bit weird. At this point, I'd been living in a big city for a few years now, and I wasn't used to everything being so deadly quiet at night. All I could hear was crickets, and maybe sometimes a wild animal on the nearby mountains calling out into the night. It made it quite hard to sleep. I decided to move into my parents' bedroom. At least they had a TV in there, and I could keep it on at night for some background noise. One night, my cousin came to spend the night with me. Her mom was working the night shift, and she didn't want to be home alone. We decided to watch some horror movies and eat a pizza in bed. At some point, I fell asleep, but my cousin Anna could not get to sleep so easily. She was quite jumpy already and easily scared. So of course the movies got her really freaked out. I was deep in sleep when she woke me up super freaked out, saying someone was in the house. My mind was foggy and I could barely keep my eyes open. I tried to tell her she was being paranoid and she should go back to sleep. 
She insisted there was someone in the house, and she was shaking and crying now. I started to really worry about her. I sat up and tried to shake myself awake when I began to hear a noise downstairs, as if someone had just closed some drawers in the kitchen. I flinched and put the TV on mute. I got up and slowly locked the bedroom door, then tiptoed back to bed to listen carefully. Now that I was more alert, I could hear the wooden floors creaking as if someone was walking around. At this point, I joined Anna in the freakout. My parents had a sensor light in the hallway. It was placed in the middle of the stairs, so it would go on if someone was walking around both upstairs or downstairs. I heard the click of the light going on, and I could see the light under the bedroom door. I was now 100% sure someone was in the house with us. I grabbed my phone to call the police, but the town was in the middle of fucking nowhere, and I found I had no service. My cousin was bawling. I had to give her a pillow to put over her mouth to muffle the noise. She was holding down on it, and even bit it to stop herself from screaming. Whoever was in the house was now climbing up the stairs. My mind was going a hundred miles an hour, and I was trying to think of all the possible scenarios. My best hope was that some neighbor had noticed my parents' car being gone for a few days. They know our dog is harmless, and they know my folks are doing quite well for themselves, so maybe they were trying to snatch some jewelry or something. I figured that if we kept quiet, they'd take whatever they wanted and then leave quickly. I told my cousin to quietly get under the bed. I looked out the window and saw nothing on the street. Since my parents' bedroom is next to mine, and mine has a balcony... I figured that if push came to shove, we could climb out the window, reach the balcony, and since it's overlooking the vegetable garden, we could jump and hop into the soft soil and hope we wouldn't break too many bones. As I moved to crawl under the bed as well, the doorknob began to rattle. Someone was trying to get in. I froze, and I swore time stopped in place. My heart was beating like crazy. I looked around, but the only weapon I could see was my mom's crochet needle, in a basket by the bed. I grabbed it, figuring I was going to have to stab this sucker in the eye or something. The doorknob rattled for a few more seconds, then the intruder walked away. I could hear them shuffling through the rest of the rooms on the floor, but they were moving far too quickly to take anything. The worst thoughts crept into my head. My dad is a detective, and he's worked some horrible cases, some involving organized crime. What if someone was there for him? It wouldn't have been the first time our family was threatened. If that was the case, I might very well be dead by morning. This thought shot adrenaline through my body, and I couldn't hear anything for a few moments. I decided I had to get out of the room and find some way to contact the police. My cousin begged me to stay, but all I could think about was the worst case scenario. If they really wanted revenge on my father or something, they would burn the house down with us in it. As stupid as it may sound now, I was worried for my dog as well. She was out there all alone. If someone were to approach her, she'd probably lick their fingers right before they stabbed her or something. I took my phone and my crochet needle and bravely left the room. I stepped into my parents' dressing room and took my dad's baseball bat as well. Then I began to make my way down the stairs. The front door was wide open. As I walked outside... I could see a man running away into the night. I immediately called the police on the landline, and to my surprise, they told me a call had already been made for that address. They were on their way. I assumed my cousin had somehow called when I was gone, so I didn't question it. The police arrived in less than a minute. It was not my cousin who called. It took us a while to understand what was going on. The officer was just as confused as I was. In the end, what happened was this. My neighbors had not been made aware I was home for the summer. They knew my parents were gone, and they saw the lights on in the house, so they began to worry. I didn't lock the door that night because I forgot, and my dog had the habit of opening it with its paws and taking a nap on the sofa downstairs. It seemed she'd opened the door at some point in the evening and decided to go back. The door was left wide open. My neighbor thought someone was in the middle of doing something nefarious, so he went to the kitchen to grab a knife from the drawer and walked around to make sure nobody was in the house. He called the police, and when I got out of the bedroom, he heard me. He got scared and ran away. The 
junior year of high school, my parents got a job offer out of state, so I was forced to move all the way across the country. I started a new school late into the academic year, about mid-March sometime. Because of this, I was having a hard time fitting into the new school. All I wanted was to make a single friend, but I was too shy to talk to much of anyone. This was around the time that my friends left MySpace to join Facebook, so I did the same to keep close to them. Some days later, I received a friend request from David. David was a guy that I had been friends with in my old town. Well, he wasn't exactly a friend, rather a friend of another friend of another friend. My friend Jerry had introduced him to the group and would bring him along every time all of us would hang out together. I knew that David was a year older than us, and he had gone to a different school as well. Other than that, though, none of us really knew a single thing about him. In fact, we always just kind of referred to him as Jerry's friend because he never even bothered to talk to any of us. Obviously, when I received a friend request from him on Facebook, I was more than a little bit confused. He had hardly ever spoken a single word to me when I lived near him. So, for him to want to be friends with me after all of this time seemed a little bit strange. I was really lonely, though, and desperate for friends, so I didn't really care. Other than not really being sociable, nothing had really ever seemed off about him, at least not at the time. Looking back, I remember that looking through his profile, he seemed to hardly have any pictures or friends when I accepted his request. Like I said, though, this was around the time that people had just started using Facebook, so it didn't seem all that weird for him to have such a barren profile. Over the years, his friend list got a lot bigger, even more so than mine, so I didn't really think anything of it. Anyway, I digress. I accepted his request. It was like this that David and I became friends. He told me he had just started university, and he was quite lonely, because he was also too shy to make friends in person. I sympathized with him that I was having a hard time in my school as well, for the exact same reasons, and we started to bond over that. Little by little, we started to talk more and more. He shared his problems with me, and I shared mine with him. When it was time for me to apply to university, he even helped me out. He taught me how to sign up for my SATs and ACTs, and helped me to apply to scholarships. He even paid for one of my application fees, using a Visa gift card so I didn't receive any of his personal information. Then, when I started university, he helped me out with that as well. He told me where to buy books, gave me studying tips, provided emotional support. So when he asked for my phone number, I didn't hesitate for a second to give it to him. David was now one of my best friends, and I wanted to keep him close, even if physically we were far away from each other. It was around this time that he began to share more of his life with me. All of it was pretty normal stuff. He had a job at Pizza Hut, which he hated, but needed to keep in order to pay his bills. He also played soccer, but not for a university or anything, just a group of guys that got together on the weekends to unwind a bit. I think the biggest reveal was that he'd flunked out of university, and that I was the only one that knew because he was too embarrassed to tell anyone else. He also said at one point that he had to move back in with his mom, which he seemed to hate a lot. Two, maybe three years into our friendship, my family decided to take a trip back to the city where we had lived, prior to moving across the country. I excitedly told him and all of my old friends. Most of them were excited about the idea of us all hanging out together again, because after high school we'd all gone our different ways. When I contacted David, though, he showed very little interest, in fact, he seemed quite opposed to the idea. I thought this was weird. You know, I wasn't just some stranger he had met online, but rather someone who had been close to him for many years now. I kept insisting and asking for a reason, and then he finally gave me one. He told me his pictures had been heavily edited, and he was afraid of disappointing me if we were to meet in real life. I told him it didn't matter what he looked like. I just wanted to meet him and hang out in person for the first time in a long time but he still refused to do so. Instead, he started being a massive asshole to me. He knew exactly what buttons to push, all my insecurities and secrets. He started using that knowledge to hurt me badly, so I stopped talking to him for a while. Some weeks later, I met up with my friends as planned, and much to my surprise, I saw David there, looking exactly like he did in all of those pictures. I didn't understand why he'd lied about photoshopping them, 
or why he said he didn't want to meet me, only for him to show up at our friend's house. I was so angry at him that I didn't ask any questions. I kept waiting for an apology, but he refused to approach me. He was treating me like he'd treated me back when we were in high school. I was getting really upset, but given that he was being such an asshole to me, I figured this was another attempt at getting under my skin. We were all drinking and talking about what we were up to, and when it was his time to share, he pretty much said all the same things I already knew about him. That he wished he was still in university like the rest of us, but he'd flunked out and was living with his mom. Said he was miserable there, and he wanted to move out, but his job at Pizza Hut wasn't paying enough for him to do that. At this point, I was pretty pissed off. The alcohol had given me enough courage to finally ask him why he'd been treating me so badly. He apologized and admitted he barely remembered me. Well, obviously that hurt my feelings badly. I told him about Facebook, about the mean text messages. He just kept insisting he didn't even have a Facebook. Uh, apparently he used to have a MySpace at some point, but stopped using that when he switched over to Tumblr. A Facebook account was something he'd never even considered making. I asked him about the messages, and he said I'd probably confused him with another David. In fact, he never had my number in the first place. I thought denying it was a lousy excuse, but then Jerry backed him up. The thing was, apparently David hadn't just been talking to me on Facebook, but a bunch of us. So when we kept calling him out on this shit, he told us to text this David guy, and he would prove it was not him. He set his phone down on the table, and I sent him a message. But no matter how long we waited, no new message appeared on his phone. While we were all arguing about how we needed to give it some time, the David I had been talking to for years responded, proving that we had been talking to a fake all along. Things turned pretty awkward at this point. We were all confused, and David was obviously feeling very violated. With all of us wanting answers, we opened our friend's laptop and searched up that profile on Facebook. The first thing David pointed out is that whoever this person was, they were using his mother's maiden name, not his real last name, and that while most of the people on his friends list were people that he knew in real life, none of them were people he'd actually kept in contact with. His profile picture was a dog he owned years ago, but had long since died. All measures that, looking back, I'm guessing were used by this person to keep David's actual friends from finding him on Facebook. The older pictures had all been copy-pasted from his MySpace, but most of the newer ones had been copied from his Tumblr, which he apparently uploaded to pretty often. The weirdest thing was, as he continued to scroll through this and point out the fakeness to us, he noticed some pictures he swore he'd never even seen before. Pictures from his soccer games taken from the audience view, which the fake David had insisted his brother had taken. The real David said his brother never went to a single one of them, nor did any of his family members or friends. Further exploring his own fake profile, David pointed out that while a bunch of his status updates were things that never happened, a lot of them were actually quite accurate, and things he'd never shared with anybody. Whoever this person was, they'd been watching David for a long time. They knew his schedules, they knew what movies he went to, what ice cream flavors he liked, even his favorite bands. Whoever this was knew every single thing about him. We tried to confront this imposter, but they never answered the messages after, and instead the profile was deleted before we had the chance to examine any further. We never did get any answers. I don't know why that person pretended to be David for so long, or why they did it in the first place at all. All I know is I felt extremely violated for having shared so many private details of my life with him, I also felt extremely bad for the real David. I wondered for the longest time how this person found him, and how they managed to learn every private detail of his life. A few months back, my mother called me up, saying she'd found a profile with her name, but with my pictures on it. She thought I'd made a second profile. I didn't tell her the truth because I didn't want to scare her, but the truth is, I hadn't even known it existed. I'd always set my Facebook to private, and I no longer accept random friend requests, nor do I post my pictures anywhere else. This profile only seemed to have old pictures of me, from the time when I'd actually been friends with that David's profile account. 
There wasn't weird stuff like David's soccer game pictures or anything like that, but the account was still active, and it had been for a while. None of the friends were people I actually knew, and the updates were all things that I'd told that fake David I'd been doing in real life. I don't know if the profile belonged to the same person exactly, but I'm extremely average looking, so I don't know why anyone would want to use my pictures when there are way prettier girls online to pretend to be. I'm guessing that it had to be him. I don't know. I just reported the profile, and it now no longer exists. Sometimes, I wonder if that person is still pretending to be me, or if they've moved on to pretending to be someone else. I live in a small suburb, and nothing too crazy happens there. I lived in a small complex that was almost like a gated community, minus the gate. It was fairly safe, and even when I would walk the 10 to 15 minutes home from my friend's house at 12 a.m., I had never been in too much of a panic. It was just a quiet suburb, nothing more, nothing less. I got a job in my junior year of high school, about three years ago. It was working at a local pizzeria that was about a block or so away from my house. My shift would end at around 11 p.m., and I would walk home soon after. We were along one of the busiest roads in town, and it was always lined with cars from the houses on the street. One night, I was walking, when from inside one of the cars, I heard a loud knock on the window. I didn't see any light inside, but I could see what I thought was the shape of someone hiding in there. I ran home in less than two minutes after. I was pretty spooked out, but I let it pass me by because, again, nothing bad ever happened in my town. The very next night, though, I heard a loud knock on my front door, which soon turned into banging. Then, someone began ringing the bell incessantly for 15 minutes straight. A few weeks before, a similar thing had happened. It was just one of my neighbor's guests who'd gotten the wrong house and thought they'd locked her out. I thought perhaps it might be a similar case, but when I peeked out, I could only see the silhouette of a large man I didn't know at the door. My grandma and I called the cops, but by the time they got there, he was already long gone. My best friend walked me to school every day after that, and eventually I began to feel safe again. No incident occurred for about six months after. One day after school, though, I was walking home. There's a large cul-de-sac a block over from my house, and a man drove up to one end of it and started calling out to me. The man looked vaguely familiar. I couldn't remember where I'd seen him before, perhaps a co-worker or something. We were nearby my job, so I thought it might be a new driver. I'd waved at my boss from the window on my walk home, so maybe my boss had said to catch up with me so he could introduce himself or something. The guy was in his mid-thirties, Hispanic looking, and his name was George. He was fairly attractive, drove a clean car, and looked somewhat presentable. He said I was beautiful, and asked if I wanted to hop in for a ride so he could take me out. I declined, and he asked if he could have my number then. I mistakenly gave him my name, but I did not tell him my number, only that I was 16 years old. He apologized and drove off. I figured that would be the end of it, because I was surely underage. Another six months passed by. It was winter once again, and I was bringing a package to the post office. After school, I took the 15-minute walk in the snow at 3 p.m. It's still bright out, and people were now coming home from work. The kids were also walking home, so there were a lot of people around. I crossed the big intersection which marked the halfway point from my house to the main street with the post office when I hear someone call out my name. I turn and see George at the light. I started walking faster. He sped into a different street to turn around and be at the smaller street I was crossing. Hey, need a ride? As I ran faster to the main road with the post office, he tried to stop me in his car three more times. I finally made it onto the main road and ran to the office. George parked right next to me and said, Hey baby, why won't you talk to me? I noticed he was about to get out of the car, so I screamed for him to leave me the fuck alone or I'd call the cops. He looked scared, said sorry, and I ran into the post office to cry. I regretted not calling the cops in that moment, but from what I know now, I don't think they would have cared much. 
Eventually, I started to get rides to go from my job to my house, even though it was only a block away. I would only go to the post office if I really had to as well. I basically ran home every day after school because I was terrified. Things started to calm down and I began to forget about him again, until about five months ago. My best friend was walking home around 10 p.m., about a 20-minute walk. She'd made this walk before, both alone and with me, and had no issues. As she passed the large intersection that marks the halfway point, she noticed a car. Something felt weird about this, but she tried to brush it off. It sped right past her. She eventually reached the pizzeria, and a car parked next to it rolled down its window and asked if she wanted to hop in for a ride. She said no and walked further to get to her house, which was another five minutes away. He kept stopping and yelling for her to get in. By the time she reached her apartment, she looked out the window and saw him still parked outside. It took an hour for him to leave. She texted me this and I asked about his description. I realized right away it was George. We did call the cops to tell them, giving the best description we could, but they basically just laughed it off. It's just him thinking you're pretty, just don't get in the car. I posted something on Facebook warning everyone about this guy, as a lot of my high school friends live nearby as well. A girl private messaged me freaking out, saying he'd followed her home multiple times. Another girl messaged me as well, and told me she used to work at the local bar. He would stay outside hiding and waiting for her, until one day he managed to follow her all the way home. Then he started to bang on her door repeatedly, and parked outside her house every night for a couple of weeks. The cops, of course, never did anything, as they said he wasn't breaking in or threatening her. I've since moved, but it feels like he's everywhere somehow. I wonder if he's ever done anything worse. I wonder what it would take for the cops to take him seriously. When I was about 9 or 10, I was invited to a classmate's birthday party at some swimming baths. All of us were the same age. It was a small class of about 20 kids or so, and I was pretty sure everyone had been invited. Just to clarify as well, I'm a boy. Anyway, I got kind of separated from everyone else, and now it was just me and this one girl all alone. I wasn't particularly close friends with her or anything, but I did know her, as she was in my class. To describe the location we were in, it was like a tunnel that connected the main wave pool to a lazy river. There wasn't really anyone else around, just me and her in complete silence, when suddenly, out of nowhere, she lunged at me without any warning. She grabbed my head and shoved me underwater. I was a pretty skinny kid, and she was much bigger than me. Also a bit of a tomboy, so she was stronger as well. About 20 seconds went by as she held my head underwater. I furiously tried to free myself, but she would not let go. Fight or flight and mass panic began to take over, and eventually I somehow managed to force my way free. I was coughing and spitting out water as I emerged. I remember just looking at her in complete shock. I think I just began to ask why she did that when she grabbed me again and shoved my head even deeper under the water. It felt like a lifetime before I fought my way free once again. Both times I genuinely thought she was going to drown me. She didn't even try to let me up. I had to fight my way free. I didn't know how to swim at this time, but the water in the lazy river and the tunnel was only about chest high. I began to rapidly backpedal away from her. She was giggling and laughing, as if it was the funniest thing in the world. She had this crazed look in her eye and a grin on her face. I couldn't climb out to escape, as it was a tunnel, so I had to try my best to get out of there. As I was backpedaling, she was following me. I made sure to keep a distance, so she couldn't lunge at me again. She was slowly gaining on me, though. I tried to reason with her. I was so scared of her that I was just babbling nonsense. I tried to distract her by suggesting we go down the water slide together. I think it actually worked somehow. I could see her thinking it over, and she stopped trying to chase me. I managed to exit the tunnel and the water, and she slowly followed me. She seemed to be a bit unsure now. I felt a lot more safe, as I was now out of the water and could see other people around as we headed toward the slides. 
I kept talking all the way about how fun the slides were, but she didn't really speak at all. She had this strange look on her face the entire time. After we went down the slides, I caught up with my friends and stuck with them the rest of the time. I was extremely shaken up. I never did tell them about it, as it was embarrassing to admit a girl had just tried to drown me twice, and I was worried about getting teased. Anyway, fast forward to adulthood. This girl turned out to be a lesbian, I guess. Not that there's anything wrong with that. What is wrong, though, is that she got with a partner who had two or three kids from a previous relationship with a man. Turns out they would torture the kids and eventually killed one of them. She's currently serving life in prison. I told my friends about the swimming pool incident after hearing about her crimes. I'm pretty sure they think I'm just bullshitting them, as none of them took me very seriously. Maybe I was being a bit light-hearted about it, as I joked I was almost victim number one. Nonetheless, though, it's a bit crazy to think back on, as she obviously was a genuine psychopath. If I'd never fought her off to escape, and then convinced her to go down that slide with me, I genuinely believe she would have killed me in that tunnel. This might be a little bit long, but it still gives me nightmares. I'm a 21-year-old female. I drive from Miami to Daytona Beach near Orlando almost every other week or so. I make sure to fuel up before I start off. But this one day, this one unfortunate day, I forgot. I left Daytona around 12 a.m., driving back to Miami. I drive a black Mustang 40th anniversary, and I was literally flooring it back home through I-95. The entire route was pretty much empty, other than a few trucks and small cars here and there. I was jamming to some good music, not paying much attention to what was going on with my fuel tank. At around 2.30 or 2.45, though, the low fuel warning popped up. I saw it and started looking for the nearest exit, which happened to be Boynton Beach. I'd never been there before, and I had no idea, and still don't really, about what the area is like. I took the exit and saw a Circle K just off the exit. I was a little bit relieved, because now at least I wouldn't run out of fuel in a place I'd never been to before. With barely enough fuel to spare in my car, I pulled up to this gas station. It was totally empty. I didn't even see a single car inside or outside the road. There were no other people other than a single tall man wearing a red-colored jacket. He was walking around near the side of the gas station store where all the parkings were. He wasn't very close to the pump I was at. I was a little bit unnerved but I tried to shake off my fear by telling myself it was nothing. The man at this point was only looking at the ground, but I could see he was kind of walking in the general direction of my car. I was still inside contemplating whether I should get out or stay inside. Usually I would have just gotten out and fueled up, not being scared at all, but something in my gut was telling me to lock the door right now and wait inside until either the man went away or walked past my car. At this point, the guy was only a few feet away, still not even looking at me. I tried to tell myself, it's okay, he doesn't even care that I'm here, I should just get out and do it. Then though, my worst fear came to life. The man looked straight up at me and dashed toward the driver's side door. He tried his hardest to yank it open. At this point, it was around 3 a.m., with no other people in the general vicinity. I froze for a moment and thought I was going to die. He pulled on the door handle desperately, trying to force it open. Somehow, I got my senses back. I turned my car back on and floored it. He was holding on so hard, he didn't even let go of the door handle until I hit the gas pedal. I'm thankful my low-fuel car still started and drove off. I had nothing to defend myself with, other than a plastic fork I'd gotten from Panda Express earlier that day. I still can't get over the whole experience. It scares the living crap out of me. Now this happened a very long time ago. I'm not going to mention when or where though, and I'm submitting this anonymously. 
I don't want people going back and finding more about it and then lashing out at me or something. I was 13 years old at the time this happened, and my brother was 11. As I mentioned, this was quite a long time ago. I think that nowadays, not a lot of parents would put a 13-year-old in charge of an 11-year-old, but that was not so unusual back then. In fact, I was looking after my little brother all the time, before either of us even hit 10 years old. After a while, of course, always keeping my eye on him, it began to get very annoying. Oftentimes, it interfered when hanging out with my friends, and it was quite a drag when I would try to talk to girls as well. It was all around just a pain in the ass, really. One day, during a really hot summer, our parents decided to drop us both off at the local swimming pool for the day. My dad had to work, and my mom had some errands and stuff to run. Plus, she had to do work as well for the church. It was extremely hot, and there was no way we could afford air conditioning at the time. We only had one old fan in the house and a sprinkler in the yard we could go play in, but the swimming pool seemed to be a much better option. Of course, the pool was very crowded. Lots of families would drop their kids off there during the summertime, actually. And of course, even though I knew it already, my mom stressed to me over and over again, Keep an eye on your brother at all times. Some of my friends were there at the pool as well. I got to talking to them and they told me about this new girl who'd moved into town. She would be starting school that fall and apparently she was really hot. So of course, like any young boy, I wanted to check her out. I knew the lifeguards would be watching my brother in the water anyway, so surely everything would be fine. I went with the guys and the girl was really cute. My buddies all dared me to approach her, which admittedly was a brave thing for a 13-year-old boy to do. Of course, I couldn't just chicken out in front of them, so I did just that. She was a very sweet girl, actually. We ended up talking for quite a while. Her parents were at the pool with her, and eventually they called her back to join them. I went back to the water to see how my little brother was faring. Only problem was that now I couldn't find him anywhere. This was a small town in a rural area, so although I said the pool was crowded, that's a relative term. It wasn't like busy water park crowded or anything like that. I should have been easily able to pick him out of the water, but no matter where I looked, he just didn't seem to be there. I frantically searched around the area surrounding the pool and couldn't find him there either. My heart started beating faster, and I began to panic. I rushed to the building where the showers and concession stand were. He wasn't there either. You couldn't leave the pool without going through that building. I went over to the attendant and asked if an 11-year-old boy had left the pool on his own in the previous hours. He told me no. I then went to the lifeguards and my buddies. I thought perhaps there was a chance I'd simply missed him. It's easy to occasionally miss someone in a crowd, especially if you're freaking out. The lifeguards ordered everyone out of the pool. Fortunately, there were no drowned children at the bottom or anything. But unfortunately, my brother was still nowhere to be found. The lifeguards had to call my mother at the church. I had never before lost track of my brother like this before. I had no idea what to expect when she showed up. I was only thankful that the police were already at the pool, or she probably would have whipped my ass right there in front of everyone. The trouble I got into at home is not something I want to go into very much. My butt has PTSD from the experience, but that was minor compared to the fear I felt for my little brother. Hell, I didn't even have time to feel guilty, although I knew that I was. My only concern was for him, and what the hell had happened. All day and all night, I expected the police to bring him home, but that didn't happen. I waited the next day too, and it still didn't happen. The town organized a search to look for him. I kept expecting to hear from them that they had found him, but that didn't happen either. After about a week of him not being found, I began to fear the worst. I thought to myself that he must be dead. I was terrified every waking moment, expecting to hear the news that his dead body had just been found. Nearly two weeks after the initial disappearance, we got a call from the police. They had found my brother, and thankfully, he was alive. Unfortunately, that's not the entire story. Remember the attendant telling me that no boy had left on his own? 
Well, that's because he had left with one of the lifeguards who was getting off duty. He lured my brother out of the pool and into his car with promises of ice cream, a treat he rarely ever got. He then abducted my brother to his house with him. For all that time, he kept my little brother locked in his basement. He didn't do anything sexually to him, but there was a lot of mental and physical torment when my brother wouldn't do what he was told to do. The scariest part for him was thinking that he would never get out and see any of us again. Here's the weirdest part, though. The lifeguard that took him was not an adult. He did this while his parents were out of town for a few weeks. They came back early and caught him with my brother in the basement. If you think I felt bad for my parents punishing me, what they did to him had to be legendary. The police thought he was either planning on killing or releasing my brother before his parents got home, but because they arrived early, no one ever found out for sure. My brother had to live with it without much help for a long time. Mental health assistance had a very bad stigma back then. Luckily, we're both still alive today, and he forgave me for my negligence a long time ago. A few weeks ago, I went outside at around 3 a.m. to move the garbage to the curb. The pickup would be coming later that morning, and I often did this chore in the middle of the night. I tend to keep weird hours, and as the weather warms up for the summer, I find the warm nights preferable to the sweltering days. I was not worried about bothering my neighbors too much, since I didn't use noisy bins, and all the houses directly next to me were currently empty. Actually, I found the quiet of the neighborhood at night to be very relaxing. Unfortunately, since I don't use bins, animals are able to get into the bags a bit easier. While this doesn't happen often, it had happened on this night. I was outside picking up the strewn about garbage and putting it into another bag when the silence of the night was suddenly broken by multiple police sirens. At first, they seemed very distant, and while they startled me, it was not at all unheard of for sirens to sound at night here. Usually, though, it would be quite a distance away. As I listened, still bagging the garbage, I could tell multiple sirens were getting closer to my location. Then, just as suddenly as they'd started, they stopped again. All there was was silence. By the time they'd stopped, it sounded like they were four or so blocks away. The silence was very intense. I began to haul the bags back to the curb, when the neighborhood dogs all started barking at once. It was like every dog in the neighborhood had suddenly got the cue to start barking. Many were even howling like crazy. It continued for a minute or so. Once again, it stopped just as suddenly as it had started in the first place. I hadn't realized at first that I hadn't heard any barking or howling while the sirens were going. Normally, that's how it would work. They would start at the same time, but these dogs had started up separately from the sirens and stopped all at once. That was not normal. I went back to the side of the house to grab some more bags when the silence was broken for a third time. A single chime in the night, like someone getting a phone notification. This time, the sound was not blocks away. The sound was right there, right next to me no more than a foot away. As I said, the area directly around me was supposed to be empty. I was done. The rest of the garbage could wait until morning. I didn't see anyone in the darkness, but that just made it even worse. That meant there was someone nearby in hiding that I couldn't see. I immediately rushed back into the house and left the garbage for the morning. I don't know how these things were related. If the cops had been chasing someone who was fleeing and that caused the dogs to bark after, or if someone was playing sounds on their phone as they approached my house. Maybe it was all just a coincidence, but I don't think I'll be taking out the garbage at 3am anymore. For the last few days, I've been reading about various run-ins with creepers, stalkers, and other downright freaky people. Now that I've gotten all good and inspired, I figured I'd add my own story to the list. This started about five years ago. 
My family, consisting of myself, my brother Alec, and of course my mother, were moving around quite a lot at this time. My mom was having a hard time finding a full-time job that paid well. On several occasions, we'd been forced to move out in the middle of the night even. This would all change when she got a job at a well-known lock manufacturer, just a city over. The company even provided her the money to rent a house near the factory, and things were starting to look up for sure. The move proved to be pretty unremarkable, as was our first few weeks in this new place. Despite not really being anything special, it was almost paradise to us kids. The neighborhood was a regular working-class area, loaded with other kids and plenty of things to keep us busy. Ever since our father had passed away when I was about ten, life had been pretty touch-and-go. Now, it's almost like things used to be, at least for a while. During this time, we did all our usual stuff. Mom worked as much as possible, Alec and I attended school, and then we started to hear the noises. I was the very last to notice them, actually. I think Alec had mentioned them to me at one point, but I initially wrote them off as nothing. My mom hadn't bothered to say anything about it for a few days, either. I assume she didn't think much of it, either. One morning at breakfast, though, we all heard it together. This one resembled a ringing chime on a phone or something. It only happened twice that morning, one after another. All three of us began to compare notes on what we'd heard, and we were relieved to know we weren't the only persons hearing these things. We agreed that it might be some sort of bird outside or something. This was not the only sound we'd been noticing. But for this day at least, we put it out of our minds and began to discuss the more important goings-on in our lives. Nothing else of note would occur on that day, but the idea itself had been brought up. We'd all be far more tuned in and wouldn't hesitate to mention anything new in the future. For the next few weeks, every now and then, one of us would hear a bump on the floor or a scratching sound or something. We'd make a mental note of it and go on with what we were doing. On weekend mornings when we were all together, we'd mention the week's odd experiences. We even searched the house multiple times over. At one point, we discovered a small hole leading into the attic. We figured a little critter was going in and out and making some of the sounds. There were still a few noises, though, that would have been impossible for a small animal to make. We thought we may have our answer finally, but some lingering doubts still remained. The real trouble started, though, when the food began to disappear. This part of the story affected me specifically. For as long as I can remember, I've had a problem with my weight. I've learned to combat it in the years since, but my childhood was made very difficult because of this. This was made even worse by my mom. She'd always been very thin and beautiful, and I couldn't understand why I was not. When the food began to disappear from the kitchen, she of course always blamed it on me. This incident, in addition to a few others, damaged my relationship with my mom so badly that her and I still don't speak often. I'd estimate we'd been living in this house for around five months now. Mom and I were now barely speaking, and the noises were still an ongoing problem. We'd all decided since that the house must be haunted. After all, almost a month after covering the hole in the attic and another we discovered leading into the basement, the sound still continued. What had once simply been a strange issue had now become very frustrating. It added to all of our own issues. Alec himself had been having breathing problems akin to some chronic bronchitis. He just started his freshman year of high school and was playing in the school band as well. On this particular week, he'd been doing well enough with his symptoms to go on a trip out of town. Unfortunately, soon after arriving, his symptoms blew back up and he was sent home for treatment. He arrived back home in the middle of the day when my mom and I were not around. Things were quiet at first, but soon he heard noises coming from the front bathroom. He called out, but no one answered. Not really knowing what was going on, he walked over to the door and opened it. To his complete horror, a man he didn't know was standing half-dressed inside, staring at him. The man moved towards him. Believing he was going to be attacked, my brother fled from the house and ran to a neighbor's for help. This is where he stayed until the cops completed their search. 
What they discovered would destroy our newfound sense of peace and cause long-term damage. When I arrived home, my mom was still speaking with the police. My confusion quickly gave way to terror after hearing their story. As they cleared the home, nothing appeared out of the ordinary at first. That was until they searched the basement. There, they discovered a makeshift bedroll hidden under the stairs, behind a large stack of boxes. Although the intruder was gone, from what they found, it looked like he'd been sleeping there for quite some time. I felt like I'd been kicked in the stomach, and I became slightly hysterical for a moment. Once I got myself composed, I asked about Alec. He was still across the street and refused to return home. His hands were shaking, sweat was pouring down his face. A few hours passed by, and the authorities had all they needed for the time being. We all returned to the house in a vain attempt to move on, but the side effects began to show themselves almost immediately. Alec was eventually convinced to return, but he was never the same. Nightmares became a nightly occurrence. He was unable to sleep until my mom and I showed him the basement was empty. His breathing troubles grew worse by the day, and I too was very affected. Every minute inside that house made my skin crawl. As for my mom, she didn't say anything, but her sleep too had obviously been hindered. With no news of an arrest, we were all drowning in fear. We did all we could think of to comfort each other, but it didn't really do any good. At the end of the seventh month, we moved into a new place. This was a three-bedroom condo without an attic or a basement. I remained there for another two years before getting a place of my own, where I've been ever since. After moving away from that house, it seems all our lives improved greatly. I'm fit, happy, and in a loving relationship. My mom found love with a gentleman from work and they married a year ago. Alan's breathing problems slowly disappeared after the move. Doctors discovered his problems were likely related to massive amounts of black mold we'd been inhaling. After the diagnosis was made, the health department contacted the landlord, only to discover the house had been demolished soon after we left. I saw this as an admission of guilt. The intruder is still on the loose, of course. As far as I know, he was never identified. Probably will never know the full story. He could have gotten in through an unlocked door or a loose window. At that point, he could have even had a key made for the back door. Our big ring of keys that hung on a hook next to the kitchen wouldn't be hard to find. From then on, he'd have free reign over the house whenever he wanted. He'd more than likely been listening in to all our plans from his cubby in the basement, and that idea still gives me shivers. He was content in knowing when he could come and go safely without fear of ever being caught. That was until Alec arrived home uninspectedly. I suppose it's no longer important that he was caught, though. What's important is that we've all moved past the experience, and any long-term effects have dwindled in time. One small thing does arise, however. I wonder if our intruder has moved on to another basement. It's a part of the home most of us spend little to no time in. Perhaps you reading this are one of those people. Can you be so sure no one is lurking in the areas you never check, listening to your every word and movement? Maybe you should go check for once. Just to be sure. Alright, so this happened when I was about 11 years old. I'm a girl, by the way. I had a friend who was 12, also a girl, over at my dad's house for the first time, and we were having quite a lot of fun together. My dad went out into the front yard to take a phone call at some point, at this time, it was about 10.30 or so at night. We were both hyped up off Dr. Pepper and Mountain Dew, and we were so hyper, we decided to follow my dad outside. We mainly stayed in the front yard, until we decided we wanted to go back inside. Me and my friend jumped the back fence, because we were right next to it. For some context, I had a pit bull and a large German shepherd who shared the backyard. My friend and I went up to the second floor and were playing with some makeup. About 30 minutes later, we went back downstairs. I could hear my dogs barking and crying like crazy. I decided to let them in the house. The dogs had their own fenced-off area in the backyard in order to not interfere with the garden. My dad hadn't let them back in for the night yet. 
My friend pointed out that my dad was still on the front porch. I went to the back door to open it, only to jump in surprise when I saw a man crouching by the back gate, staring at my back door. He was next to the side of the gate we had previously jumped over. I asked my friend to stay there and make sure that the man stayed in place. I was going to go check if my dad was still outside. Sure enough, there he was, still on the phone. For whatever reason, I didn't tell my dad this man was in our backyard. Instead, me and my friend watched him out there in terror for about 20 minutes. After those 20 minutes, he moved across the street and crouched behind a car for another five, then came back to the gate. I decided it was unsafe for my dogs to still be back in the yard, so I turned on the light to help me see clearer and let the dog's gate open. After I let my dogs in, the guy was still crouched and not moving a single bit. After 10 more minutes, which to me seemed like 10 hours, passed by, the man was still there. He stood up suddenly. After seeing him standing, I realized he was holding something, which seemed to be some sort of metal pipe or perhaps a bat. I locked the door, and my friend and I ran across the house to the front door to tell my dad to come back inside. I never did give him an explanation as to why, but I'm guessing he saw the urgency in my face or voice and listened. After that, we didn't see the man again. Somewhere on the wind-blown plains of Middle America, there stands a home. It's a regular, unassuming home. Nothing in its appearance draws your attention, nor marks it out as any different from the others. But this home once held a dark secret, one that would remain hidden for the most part. At least, until today. You see, once upon a time, not all that long ago actually, this was my home. I was among a small number of young men. We resided in the dark depths of the home's basement, five in total. We existed there not by choice, but by decree. Our days were consumed with work, while our nights were spent in dreaming. Among those dreams, we often entertained the idea of freedom. Fortunately for myself and the others, one brave member of our community would make these dreams a reality. She's the reason I'm able to share my story with you today. I suppose I'll start with the larger aspects of the tale before focusing on myself. Of course, no real names or locations will be used for the sake of privacy. It all began way before I was actually born, around the mid-1960s or so. A young charismatic preacher built a dedicated group around him. His theology was different from most in the faith. According to his teachings, Mary Magdalene was given the power to speak the word of God by Jesus himself. Upon his ascent to heaven, Mary effectively became the head of the Christian church. Through generations, this line was passed down into our Holy Father, who traced himself back to Mary Magdalene herself. This idea was surprisingly well received at the time. By 1980, they had amassed a congregation of over 3,500. However, as times changed, more and more devotees left the church for a number of different reasons. When I was born in 1993, our group had dwindled to a paltry 125 members. A few years earlier, this church had purchased a small piece of land in the upper area of the Midwest. All the buildings were built by hand by the congregation. Everyone was required to live on this compound, and all labor was evenly divided amongst the members. It was very similar to the communes popular in the 1960s and 70s. I can only assume our church was built around the same model. I'm leaving out quite a bit, but I just wanted to give you the general idea. The community was very similar to the agrarian lifestyles of centuries past, and most all work was done by hand. It wasn't like in my time machines were shunned or anything. Many people just took pride in doing them on their own, no matter the hardship. That was the type of environment I grew up in. I'll take a few moments to explain what led to us living in a basement. From the start, females enjoyed an exalted position in our particular faith. 
they served as apostles and teachers to the young and newer members. Other than our leader himself, no other man held any position of power. This was just an accepted part of life, really, and rarely ever questioned. A male had to be married to even remain in or join the congregation. In later years, our leader even put a severe restriction on new marriages. Therefore, the younger men, unable to find a partner or simply uninterested in marrying, would be excommunicated after reaching the age of 21. Nearing the end of that time, we became little more than beasts of burden, strong hands for the fields and other things. The biggest change, though, came in 1998. The Holy Father decreed that all males must be sent to live in the youth dorm at the time of puberty. For propriety's sake, this was a basement that he'd termed the youth dorm. But we all knew it was just a regular old musty, mold-filled basement. This pronouncement only served to further fracture our already ailing group. Unfortunately for me, though, my parents were true diehards. We remained along with the very last of the devotees, so when my time came at 13 years old, I couldn't do anything. I had to take my place in the basement. Although the adjustment period was very difficult, a strong bond soon formed with my fellow prisoners, at least as I put it. From dawn till dusk, we were worked ragged, our only respite coming on Sundays, in which we spent the mornings in holy services. The remainder of the day was our own. However, those that didn't volunteer to do additional work were required to remain locked in the basement. While far more terrible things would be suffered by us during our time there, I'm still unfortunately unable to discuss them. I think it's better they stay buried, honestly. Out of nowhere, in 2010, an unlikely individual would change everything, though. Ruth was just another congregate, but by advantage of being born a woman in our group, she held a leadership position. Although not lofty by any means, it was a substantial amount of power due to the dwindling group at our time. Unknown to anyone else inside the group, she'd been building a body of information implicating our Holy Father in multiple crimes. On several visits into town, she met up with law enforcement and their colleagues in the district attorney's office. They seemed especially interested in the treatment of males in the church. Luckily, he'd also been cheating on his taxes as well, the crime he was ultimately imprisoned for. When the day came that Ruth turned over all the documents to authorities, that church ceased to exist. A judge ruled our treatment to be inhumane and immoral, and we left the basement for the final time later that week. Everything else was handled quietly behind closed doors, as to prevent embarrassment to the local community. When I was finally able to speak to Ruth face to face, I asked her why she'd done it. She said our treatment within the congregation had always bothered her, her father's in particular. Just a year prior, she had begun a secret relationship with one of the young men locked in the basement. She knew they would likely not be allowed to marry as long as things continued as they did. The last straw was what she discovered while digging, though. The extent of the Holy Father's corruption sickened her. Her initial intent had not been to destroy our group, but she realized he was inextricably woven into it. I greatly admired her and any person willing to sacrifice everything for those they love. She managed to build a respectable and happy life outside the church. My wife and I named our first daughter Ruth as a sign of respect for her. To close things out, I want to share the fate of my fellow dorm mates as well. It seems that our horrible experiences did not have any noticeable long-term side effects. All of us are now married with families. Mark, my closest friend from the church, has been with his partner for quite some time after. It's a story with many dark aspects, and I'd like to end it with a positive message. I know many of us have suffered terrible things in our lives. A great deal of us may still be suffering. Rather than my story being one of sadness, though, I prefer to view it as one of hope. I want you to make note of this. No matter how dark things may seem at the moment, better things may be waiting just around the corner.
When the headline screamed local man tortured in basement, I was naturally curious. Little did I know that I would be in the same position not even a week later. According to the story in the paper, a group of home invaders had burst into a nearby jewel dealer's home to steal a stash of diamonds he was rumored to have on site. Having caught the dealer unawares, they demanded to know the location of said stash. The dealer, as it would turn out, truthfully told the gang that no such thing existed. The only thing he did have was an empty safe in his bedroom closet. Of course, this revelation did not make the group very happy. They chose to disbelieve the homeowner, and for the next hour or so, the burglars took turns torturing him for the location of this non-existent stash. It would only be the arrival of a nosy neighbor that would cause the thieves to scatter, but by this point, the homeowner was mere minutes away from death had he not been so swiftly rushed to the hospital. A harrowing story to be sure, but never once had I ever thought that I would have anything to do with it. The extent of my riches amassed was only about 25 grand or so. It consisted of a 19th century gold and silver coin collection my father had left me. I just had the collection appraised the year before, probably why I was chosen as a target. The appraiser at the time had offered me 10000 for it, but I politely declined. The coins sat collecting dust in my floor-side safe. After that week or more went by, I was loafing on my couch watching a movie, about 2 p.m. on a Saturday, I believe, when suddenly a loud crashing came from my front door. I was so focused on the television in that moment, I nearly jumped out of my skin. I peeked around the corner just in time to see three masked figures pouring in one by one through my recently shattered door. They were surrounding me, guns raised. Within a few seconds, I was told to get down on my knees, and naturally I did so. My heart was pounding, and my mouth was bone dry. Instead of shooting me though, one of them demanded I give him the combination to my safe. This was the moment I realized who I was dealing with. I tried to play dumb. There's no safe. Do I look like a guy that would have a safe? I said. I know my ability to lie is usually better, but I wasn't exactly prepared for the situation. The shortest of the group gave me a quick attitude correction with the barrel of his pistol. Still, I could not tell. My pride and love for my father prevented me from doing so. I wouldn't be caught dead letting some thug steal his life's work. Had I been more clear-headed and given more time to think things over, perhaps I would have chosen a wiser path. To their credit, I was given plenty of opportunity to concede, but once they had me tied up in the basement, they were all business. Even as they tightened the knots and applied the gag, I was convinced it was simply a fear tactic. Surely after what had happened before, they wouldn't repeat the same mistake. But by God was I wrong. Right out the gate, one of them smashed my left hand with a hammer. The pain was unimaginable. My right hand was next. It was even worse, if that's possible. I was ready to tell them anything at that point, but I'd angered them, and they simply wanted to make me pay for that. My feet were next, then my knees. I was barely even conscious. Only then was I permitted to speak. While one guy went upstairs, the remaining two huddled in the corner talking. I could imagine my fate was being discussed. I never saw their faces. There was no reason to add murder to their list of crimes, I thought. I knew this instinctively, but I was convinced I'd not live to see the morning. The next few hours were hazy. All the adrenaline had worn off, and the pain was coming in waves so severe I passed out more than once. In the moment, it seemed death would have been more preferable, but due to some fortune, I stayed alive. I can't exactly tell you when that gang left. I wouldn't have known how long I spent tied up had my son not told me so later. Yes, my son's stubbornness was my savior. After multiple unanswered calls, he began to believe I was dodging him. The young man drove 45 miles one way just to give me an earful. I thought I was dreaming. His voice echoed down the basement stairs, and I thought I was having a death hallucination. The paramedics moving me finally woke me up, though. For a split second, I actually believed them to be my captors. 
Their faces were bare, so I was sure death was coming, but my son calmly placed his hands on my shoulders and assured me everything was all right. It's probably clear what followed next. My time in the hospital extended a long period with multiple surgeries, and the recovery after was spent in various casts, even a period of time in a wheelchair. For the most part, I managed to completely heal. The cold and damp are a chore now, but since I moved south, I rarely experienced that sort of pain. As sad as this may sound, I harbor no lasting hatred of those thieves. They may have taken something valuable, but they gave me a much more important thing back, my life and my relationship with my son. Nonetheless, when I was notified of their arrest seven months later, I was overjoyed. Only a small amount of the collection was reclaimed, most being sold long ago. Honestly, I was surprised to get any of it back at all. Presently, all of these gentlemen are a guest of the correctional system, likely for the next 30 years or more. I briefly returned to work after my recovery, but I subsequently had to retire soon after. The majority of my days are now spent in leisurely pursuits, like fishing and hunting. I learned an important lesson in that moment all those years ago. Life is a special and fleeting thing, and you should enjoy every day like it's your last. I'd gladly sacrifice a million coin collections for another day with those I love. When we're kids, we don't always listen to the adults around us. Part of growing up requires us to push on boundaries, or we'd never know when we go too far. It's just a fact of life. Adults already know this, and they try their best to let us learn on our own. Even then, though, they wouldn't hesitate to put their foot down in the best interest of your safety. I know this now, and I did the same with my kids when they were young. However, there was a time when you couldn't tell me anything. I constantly pushed those boundaries and never learned from my mistakes. That is, until I almost died in my youth. I was very much a handful. Too much for my mother, in fact. My dad had been shot down and killed in Vietnam when I was only two years old. My mother didn't date after, and both my grandfathers had also passed away. I lacked any male role models in my life. My mom tried to teach me, but she just couldn't do a very good job filling this role. This was another time, mind you, and my mom was just a small-town, simple lady. I was old enough to know she was overworked and not exactly the assertive type. Naturally, I exploited this. I had not yet fallen into crime, but she feared that I soon would. She searched out a solution to my behavioral problems, and soon came up with what seemed to be a perfect one. Spring break would soon arrive, and she would need someone to look after me during the day. This is when Dad's mother, Granny Jean, came into the picture. Mom and Granny Jean never saw eye to eye, but they kept things very civil. I'd soon discover Granny Jean seemed to be just what I needed. She'd grown up during the Depression, and that made her a tough, no-nonsense type of woman. She had no time for foolishness, but was capable of showing genuine love and kindness whenever appropriate. The two spoke on the phone, and she agreed to take me in for the week. I left for the farm on that Sunday morning, and arrived by bus later that day. A daunting trip for a lone nine-year-old. Not that I would have admitted it to anyone. Granny Jean picked me up at the station and we drove the 25 miles back to the farm in silence. I say in silence, but there was a preacher talking on the radio for most of the ride. I tried to speak up once until I got the stink eye from old granny, then figured I'd be better off just not talking. Not until breakfast the following morning, actually, did she ever truly talk to me. Afterwards, I received a quick lesson in feeding the animals, and then I was left to entertain myself. Naturally, I took off in search of trouble. Most of the day was spent walking the fields and exploring these woods. I returned briefly for lunch, then renewed my explorations. Around four o'clock or so, I came across an old abandoned farmhouse. A massive thing, two stories with a big wraparound porch. I just couldn't resist. I quickly looked through the windows to make sure no one was inside. 
Seeing nobody, I walked around back and entered. There wasn't much to see, but to me this was like a giant clubhouse. It was getting quite late, so I left with the intention of returning. That evening at dinner, I happened to make mention of that old abandoned house. No sooner than I said it though, Granny Jean jumped down my throat. That's not your property. Don't you go back there. It's old and dangerous. It's not safe. You understand me? I was terrified by her sudden reaction, and sheepishly said, Yes, ma'am. I was shocked at my own sheepishness. I'd not been in the habit of respecting my elders, but she was in full control, and she knew it well. Well, almost full control. That night, as I lay in bed, all I could think about was that old house I'd found. There was still so much to explore. I had to go back, and so I did the next morning, stealing a flashlight on my way out. Beginning where I'd left off the day prior, I climbed the creaky stairs to the second floor. Had I been smarter about the layout of old houses, I would have tried to explore the attic, but I didn't realize it was there at the time. I did encounter a door that likely led to it, but it was locked so I moved on. I still had much more to see. Having found nothing of note at this point though, I returned to the kitchen. A door I hadn't tried yet was located there. It was extremely difficult to open, but after a few hard yanks it broke free. Ahead of me were these dark stairs, leading into a basement. The darkness before me beckoned me down into it. With my borrowed flashlight in hand, I descended those old stairs. One step had long since rotten away, and I jumped. It was a miracle the step I landed on didn't snap as well. Eventually reaching the bottom, I swept this large room with the beam of light. I couldn't see much from my position, therefore I made the mistake of taking a closer look. I took two, maybe three steps, when the door above me suddenly slammed shut behind me. I'm not sure what caused it to close. A gust of wind was the most likely guess. But I was almost positive that as soon as I'd started going down the stairs, I'd already closed the door behind me. I mean, I could have been wrong, I guess. I was never good about closing doors, so no matter how improbable, it was still a possibility. I didn't want to spook myself out with any outlandish theories. I drilled back up the stairs, skipping two or three at a time. I threw myself against the old door, but it wouldn't budge. Again and again I did this, but to no avail. I was completely trapped. I began to panic. Then, suddenly I remembered the big swinging doors I'd seen when I arrived, frantically racing back down, jumping steps in pairs. The second to last broke under my weight, sending me tumbling across the floor. The room was now complete darkness. I realized my flashlight wasn't working. I shook it rapidly and banged it against things, and it would flicker back to life briefly over and over again. I returned to my feet and renewed my sprint to freedom. The doors were two heavy wooden things that opened out. I needed a lot of power to budge them. I summoned all my strength and threw my body against them, but nothing. I repeated this twice more, until I was too tired to continue. I took a break and tried to think. I closed my eyes and concentrated intensely. I tried to picture the doors outside as I'd seen them the day before. My mind's eye scanned every inch, every nail, every single board and all the hope I had disappeared in an instant. I remembered a large board straddling the doors from the outside, a sturdy 2x4 or something of similar size, spanning the entire breadth of the opening, slightly under four metal braces. I wandered back and forth around the room, examining every square inch in the little light I could receive. There were a couple of small windows, it seemed. Perhaps if I broke those, I could squeeze out. A nearby brick was put into use, but it simply bounced off the panes. I found out later it was reinforced stormproof glass. No matter the amount of foolish optimism I embodied, as the hours passed by, my courage began to fail me. Things wouldn't truly begin to suck until the night came, though. Although the days had always been somewhat warm, the night dipped below freezing. As the sun set down, the basement became colder and colder. To make things even worse, just after 11 p.m. or so, the flashlight gave out completely, shaking it no longer worked. With no moonlight, it was now completely pitch black. 
rats began to scatter all around me, and now I was at the lowest point in my young life. My surroundings terrified me more than the thought of freezing to death. Visions of rats gnawing on my limbs, being too weak to move, overwhelmed me. Sleep became harder and harder to avoid. I knew, though, that if I did fall asleep, I might not ever wake up again. I had no doubt that help would be coming sometime, but would they reach me before I froze? Or even worse, was eaten by rats? Sometime in the early hours of the next morning, I lost the battle and slipped into unconsciousness. In that sleep world, I could almost feel my soul being carried upward. I was no longer shivering. My body was now suddenly warm, and it was no longer painful either. I thought to myself that I was going to heaven. I awoke the next morning, but rather than heaven, I was back in bed. The smell of baked things floated up from the kitchen, and it was all very disorienting. Had I simply dreamed everything? I looked around and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The sun was shining through the white lace curtains. Granny Jean's cat was curled up in the chair watching me. I was wearing my favorite flannel pajamas and all seemed well. But just below the surface, something bothered me. I slipped quietly into my robes. As I stepped down the stairs, the rotten stairs of that basement flashed in my mind. Maybe I was in hell or something. A proper punishment for an unruly child like myself. I expected to be swarmed by a horde of rats at any moment. The cat ran ahead of me and turned the corner. I braced for the gruesome onslaught, but it never came. Looking to the left, I could see Granny Jean, her back to me. She sat down at the kitchen table. I stood and watched for a long time, feeling a tug of tension lurking just below the surface. A few minutes passed and Granny Jean turned to me, kindly wishing me a good morning. Are you hungry? Yeah, I answered with a quick jerk. I stood still and watched as she gathered the food. I don't think we need to discuss what happened last night. You're safe now and I'm sure even a boy as stubborn as you learned his lesson. The relief was indescribable. I fought back tears but a few escaped, the warmth now even more soothing. I didn't want her to see me crying, so I turned my back to her and spoke. No, ma'am. I've seen now just how difficult I've been. I'm sorry. And that was it. Granny Jean plated up my breakfast and we sat together as I ate, not speaking. The remainder of my visit, I stayed pretty close to the farm. I had meant every word I said that morning. It was like a veil had been lifted. All the trouble I'd caused was revealed to me. The adults around me only had the best in mind for me, yet all I ever heard in my youthful mind was no. It was like the old version of myself did die that night. When the week came to an end, Granny Jean drove me back to the bus station. As we parted, she gave me a kiss on my cheek. I'd never felt so grateful in my life. I still hold a very special place in my heart for her. This happened in the mid-60s. My family and I lived on a dead-end gravel road, without any streetlights whatsoever. It must have been in the summertime, because I remember the door being wide open, with only the screen door closed to let the air in. It was after dark, and the whole family was in the living room watching TV together. The whole family being both of my parents, my two other siblings, and I. My attention was soon taken away from the TV show, however, when I heard the sound of a car slowly coming down the road. Soon after, I heard a woman inside screaming the most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard, either before or since. I don't think any of us decided to get up and look out the door. We just rushed there and were already looking in no time flat. The car slowly turned around and was parked facing down the road the exact way it had come. No lights on inside or out, not even the headlights. It seemed to be some sort of older model car. The woman's screaming just went on and on. My heart was pounding and I couldn't catch my breath. Finally, my mother moved first and turned on the porch light. As soon as the person in the vehicle saw the light turn on, the car started to slowly drive off down the road. The woman began to scream for help as the car continued to drive out of sight. At this point, my mother shut off the front porch light 
and everyone went back to their places and sat down like nothing ever happened. No one said anything. No one did anything. I couldn't believe that my parents weren't going to do anything about this. No one ever spoke of that incident ever again. And that's the creepiest thing about that night, honestly. Not the spooky car at night with the woman screaming for help, but the fact that my zombie-like parents had no reaction to that nightmare occurring in their front drive, and they didn't do anything about it either. It wasn't until I reached my 30s that I realized the mistake we'd all made. Although what happened was technically illegal, nobody got hurt in the end, if you consider that animals aren't people. Only when I began to learn more about psychology did Isaiah's behavior begin to cause some more serious concerns. Now don't get me wrong, after we made the initial discovery, I wouldn't have left him alone with a single ant. All I'm saying is, it took me a long time to really understand just how dangerous this kid truly was, but by then it was too late. Mark, nor any other member of his family, had heard from Isaiah for years. I hadn't had a good night's sleep since learning of this either. I'm sure once I tell you what the two of us found in the basement that day, your sleep might be affected too. First things first. A brief layout of all the individuals involved. Of course, none of the names I use here are the actual people's names. I don't want innocent people getting harassed for no reason. This was back in 2003, neck deep into the summer. I'm pretty sure it was just after July 4th, actually. Both myself and my best friend Mark were now 18. Mark had a younger brother named Isaiah, and he was 12. I'd spent almost every day of the past 10 years hanging out at their house. Things at my own house were sort of out of control. But the story's not about my home life. This specific day was super hot. Even the AC was having trouble keeping up with the heat. We decided to retreat to the not often used basement in hopes of it being a cooler place to hang out. Mark and I remained down there for a few hours, but at some point we became quite restless and decided to dig through the boxes on the surrounding shelves. At the very top of one of them was a large box lacking any labels. Naturally, we just had to know what was inside this. I was a little bit taller at the time, so I was chosen to climb up the shelves and bring it down. Since I was unable to grab it with both hands, I made the stupid decision to simply knock it off the shelf. It hit the floor with a dull thud and fell over onto its side. And that's when the first corpse fell out. We thought at first it was a hat or something, but when Mark picked it up, it was obviously a decaying and dead cat. As soon as he realized this, Mark let out a startled, uh, and dropped it. Our curiosity was even stronger then. I grabbed a curtain rod laying in the corner and flipped the body over. The poor beast appeared to have had its insides ripped out. After a short discussion, we came to the conclusion it must have crawled into the box and died, only to have a rat or something come along and feast on it. Satisfied with this simple conclusion, we agreed to continue our search. I pushed the box back onto its bottom and pulled the flaps open to get a better view of what was inside. It was immediately clear that far more disgusting discoveries lay ahead. I would like to take this moment to warn anyone who's sensitive of these types of situations to stop listening now. Although I've already described a deceased animal, it's going to get a lot worse from here on out. With that out of the way, I'll continue on. As I said, I opened the flaps of the box, only to be met by a menagerie of dead animals. Most appeared to be local pets from the look of them. Mark and I were both appalled and confused. What the hell was this? Why was this even down here? Cautiously, I reached in and began to pull out the dried out husks. In the end, I found six different dead animals. Underneath the corpses was a box filled with Isaiah's old toys. I pushed them to the side and surveyed my ghoulish discovery. Five out of the six animals were cats and one additional tiny dog. From what I could tell, they'd all been strangled 
or had their throats slit. I still shiver when I think of it. A few of the cats still had a cord wrapped around their throats. It was too much for the two of us to handle alone. Mark was adamant he had no idea what was going on here, so we did the only thing we could. Mark walked back upstairs and asked his parents to come down to the basement. They were understandably disgusted at what they saw. Once again, Mark swore up and down he was not the culprit. There wasn't any question that his parents were guilty, of course. This only left Isaiah, who was in his room at the time. He was called down, and when he saw the box, he automatically looked down at the floor, a clear indication of his guilt. What followed was an hour-long interrogation. I left soon after it began. It was a family matter, not to mention my view of the innocent Isaiah had drastically changed. The little monster freaked me out. Mark would tell me more of the specifics later. The decision was made to get Isaiah counseling, and that's pretty much it. The police were never contacted, and the pet owners were never told what had happened to their beloved family members. I can understand not wanting your 12-year-old being labeled as a monster and written off, but that's exactly what he was. Mark said he tried to say the animals had attacked him at first, and he was simply defending himself, but nobody was going to buy that. Eventually, he accepted responsibility and apologized. I wasn't comfortable with this result even as a kid, but now that I know this is the sign of a budding serial killer, I'm terrified. For a few years, I lost all contact with Mark. I went off to college and moved to a new city. I began searching for him soon after learning they had moved not long after I had. It was a fresh start, as he put it. Apparently, Isaiah had stopped attending the counseling within only months of starting. He began to act out, and residents started asking questions. I knew none of this, of course. When I did track Mark down again, he would update me on everything. Our reunion fell under a swift cloud when Isaiah came up. I could tell by his tone that Mark was extremely worried. He admitted to me he was quite scared of his brother these days. He had even lost contact with him, and he feared for those around him. As I write this, no one's had contact with Isaiah in over seven years. His name comes up in various searches, but it seems he sure does like to move around a lot. He shows up in Denver, Los Angeles, Chicago, most recently Long Island. These are all cities with multiple unsolved crimes and murders. I'm not sure I'd want to talk to him even if I did track him down. I know Mark doesn't, and now maybe you'll see why my nights are fitful and long. I often blame myself for having not said anything. I catch myself searching the crowds for Isaiah's face, but I admit I probably wouldn't even recognize him these days. My fears may be unfounded. Stupid as it sounds, though, I feel terrified thinking about someone like him somewhere in the world, in a city just like ours, a real-life monster stalking the streets, and there's no way for anybody to even know. Even as I pray for everyone's safety, something tells me that something was wrong with him, and I think he's probably gotten up to some trouble since I'd last seen him. In the name of all that's holy, always stay vigilant, and be aware of random people around you, you never know who they may truly be. Back in 2015, I went to Cologne, Germany for a work trip. I put that work trip in quotes because it was all on the company dime, but all it consisted of were a bunch of team building exercises involving several different offices from around Europe and the US. There was go-karting, paintballing, numerous lunch meets, and nights out on the town as well. Although we were technically there in a professional capacity, it was basically just a paid vacation. I was honestly super psyched to be there. It was my first time outside of the US, let alone going to Europe. So, our first night there, I went out with a work buddy of mine, hitting up a few small bars after dinner to sample some fine German beers. And I do mean sampling, by the way, because despite what everyone said afterwards, we all knew darn well we couldn't get sauced up since we had our first team-building activity the following morning. So we were left drinking smaller glasses of all the different beers in one place, 
Then moving on to the other. These glasses couldn't have been any bigger than eight ounces or so, and we weren't finishing every single one of them either. I know this may sound dumb, but even though we were drinking, the aim was not to get drunk, if that makes any sense. My point is that by the time we moved on to the third bar, we were still all sober, and told ourselves this would be the last stop before returning to our hotel. We walked up to the bar, checked out the drinks menu, then ordered two small glasses of fruity, which turned out to be a bright red strawberry beer of some sort. Then, as we were talking about how awesome it was, some random guy just sidled up to us. You guys Americans? We get to talking to him, just about where we're from and stuff, and it turned out he wasn't German, but had moved there from someplace else when he was a kid. I didn't want to press him too much on it. The way he talked made it seem like kind of a touchy subject. We moved on to other topics, like why we were here visiting. It was around then he started asking if we wanted him to hook us up with any local girls. I knew exactly what he meant by that, so I politely refused on mine and my buddy's behalf, laughing it off and assuring him I was married. He moved on to drugs, asking if we wanted hashish or cocaine or ecstasy. Again, I said no thanks. The guy then kind of paused, looked us both over, and asked me something that shook me to my core. He leaned in so nobody else would hear him, and said in a very low voice, Ah, it's boys you want, yes? I can get you boys. Some very young ones. My buddy was mid-sip as the man said this. He just about choked on his drink, as I told the guy to take a hike right now. I didn't think he was serious. I thought it was supposed to come across as an insult or something. But afterwards, I wasn't so sure. I think as horrifying as it may seem... He was the kind of guy to actually be able to follow through on such an offer. Anyway, like I said, I told the man to go kick rocks since he was getting on my nerves. The man sneered at us, laughed the rebuke off, then walked away, taking a seat with a bunch of men over in the corner of the bar. Me and my buddy worked through our beers, siphoned the pythons in the bar's restroom, and headed back towards our hotel room. On the way out, I could see the men in the corner of the bar giving us major stink eye, but with me being somewhat street smart, I knew to stick to brightly lit places and try to shake their tail if they tried to follow us. We were walking for a few minutes. No one seemed to be following us so far, so I thought we were all in the clear. Shortly after, though, I realized that I was actually really, really drunk. It made sense, I guess. I had been drinking, but I was way too disoriented, like way too drunk for the amount I'd actually consumed. Last thing I remember saying is, bro, I feel so gross. And then there was just nothing. I know we kept walking for a while, but I can't remember where. And I don't remember passing out or seeing those shady guys from the bar again. Given that both my buddy and I woke up a few hours later as the sun was starting to rise and he had been completely rinsed of all his valuables, I'm willing to hazard a guess as to what happened. All the symptoms we both felt the next day were completely consistent with being drugged with GHB or some other kind of sedative. We went to report it to the cops right away. They gave us some kind of urine test, and lo and behold, tested positive for some kind of knockout drug. Not specifically GHB, mind you, but basically something that had similar effects. We both felt terrible for the next whole day. Honestly, it's not the worst thing that's ever happened to me, though. I know it could have been much worse, especially if those dudes were as shady as I think they were. That's just it, though. I think what they did was some sort of warning, a this-is-what-we're-capable-of sort of thing. I don't even know how they managed to slip something into our drinks. I have zero clue. Must have been when the guy was cleaning the glass or something, but I hadn't seen a thing. Certainly makes for some impressive sleight of hand, and made it clear that whoever we're dealing with, they knew what they were doing. Heck, if they really wanted to, they could have simply made us disappear. We missed the first team-building exercise in the morning, and the second full day of go-karting, too. That really stunk, knowing that we wouldn't be going again. But we had bigger fish to fry at the moment. No matter how detailed of a report we gave, though, or how much we pointed the cops in the right direction, they came back with nothing. I think the closest we got to a definitive answer was when one cop said he strongly suspected it being the work of an Albanian group 
who were known to scam tourists. As soon as he said that, both me and my buddy said, yeah, that sounds about right. The shady guy did say he was from another country. His unwillingness to talk about it could have been very genuine. Thankfully, we never ran into those guys again, and the rest of the trip was very fun. It made up for the initial drugging and robbery, but I always let that serve as a reminder that not everyone in a foreign place is a kindly stranger, and letting your guard down when you're traveling can come with a very heavy price. Shortly after I graduated college, I decided to do a little traveling around Southeast Asia. Now, I'm not some trust fund baby or something. The only reason I had enough money was because my dad had unfortunately died in my senior year. It was a mammoth task just to ensure that the grief didn't affect my studies too much, so by the time I graduated, I was very burnt out and a vacation was sorely needed. A few days after I arrived in Bangkok, I began exploring when I bumped into a bunch of other Americans. I know I was supposed to be soaking in ancient Eastern culture, but my gosh if it wasn't good to hear some familiar accents that far away from home. As much as it was nice for me to meet up with these guys though, they were way too crazy for me to party with. All I wanted was a few beers and some Thai street food but these crazy leathernecks were trying to take themselves out by doing things like drinking vodka while chasing snake blood. And that's not code for something either. They were literally looking for a place that would let them eat a snake's still beating heart before downing a shot of its blood. Like I said, that sort of thing was way too crazy for me. When we bumped into a Canadian dude who was working more at my pace, I said my goodbyes to those other guys who were headed to some crazy strip club. Me and the Canadian moved on to somewhere uh, much more chill. We found a little sports bar, got to talking about hockey, and even ended up chatting with these two very attractive South African girls. I'm working on one, he's working on the other, and at one point one of the girls invites me to the little smoking area for a cigarette. I don't smoke myself, but I sure followed to keep up the momentum. So we ended up chatting and flirting out in front of this little sports bar. Right until we heard a blood-curdling scream, our conversation ceased immediately. We were both searching around, trying to find out where that scream had come from. It didn't take us long to find out though. Just across the street, clear as day, some random Thai guy was beating the shit out of some black girl, hitting her in the face over and over again. What's worse, no one was doing a thing about it, just walking past pretending it wasn't happening. In my thinking, I realized that not only should I do something, but I was being presented with a golden opportunity to impress this girl by becoming a genuine white knight. I gave her my beer to hold. I ran over and tried to break up what looked like a very one-sided fight. Hey, what are you doing, man? You can't hit her like that. He let her go when she ran away. Now, it was just me and this guy, with almost everyone in the street staring at us, waiting for me to do something. I lowered my voice and adopted a slightly more respectful tone. Look, man, you can't just hit girls like that. The guy stepped up to me, a grin on his face. I realized now the bouncers from a nearby bar, as well as a handful of tuk-tuk drivers, were all walking over to encircle us. It was only then that I realized there was a reason why no one had tried to stop this guy from hitting that girl. He was somebody. Somebody well known to locals and tourists alike. Someone bad. You don't know who I am, do you? The guy said in alarmingly perfect English. Most Thai people know at least a little bit, so they're able to corral tourists. But it's always heavily accented. This guy talked with what I can only describe as a British accent. He was that well spoken. I told him no, not exactly the truth, but more like I just needed to see where the situation was headed. Then, as I'm eyeing this guy's backup, which had materialized out of nowhere, the man took a step forward, put his hand around me so he was grabbing the back of my neck, and then drew his fist back in preparation to punch me. I'm not exactly an MMA master or something, but I did attend some jujitsu classes in high school. I was able to block the punch by dropping my head and raising both hands flat to my forehead. I followed up by shoving him away from me, then trying to get away from there. 
Before I could do anything, though, bang, someone behind me or to the side of me threw a sucker punch, and I felt my knees buckle out from under me. Next thing I know, I'm being helped into the bar by some guys who'd seen me getting destroyed out there. They were trying to hold me up, and trying to walk me behind a bar. Probably to give me some first aid in a back office or something. I was hazy beyond belief. I was grateful enough to the guys helping me that I tried to turn a little to thank them, and that's when I saw it was the same guys who just knocked me out in the first place. They weren't holding me tight to keep me steady, they were holding me so I couldn't get away. They wanted to get me in the back of that bar all right. I realized it probably wasn't for anything good. I started to buck and wriggle, trying to escape their grip. They started to hit me more. I screamed for help, and turned to look at all the customers, trying to see if any of them would help me. Then again, it was just like when that girl was getting punched. All these faces, western and eastern alike, were just staring silently, or acting like nothing was happening at all. I'd never been as scared as that in all my life, man. It's one thing to have something scary happen to you, but it's another when all kinds of people can see it, but are too scared or too apathetic to do anything about it. That's a special kind of terror right there. Comes with a certain feeling of doom. I don't know how else to describe it. Like you're condemned. Then, right as they were getting me behind the bar, they pried my grip off the bar hatch. I heard this oddly familiar voice. Hey! Get your hands off that man. I looked up. It was the American Marines I'd been drinking with earlier. They must have been walking past still in search for their snake blood and heard all the screaming I was bellowing out. Being the kind of people they were, they ran in the direction of the trouble and found me. I know you probably want to hear about some big bar fight that exploded into action with tables and chairs being thrown as the brave Americans came to my rescue. But fortunately for me, there was no such destruction once the Marines made it clear I was with them. I figured the Thai gangster thugs must have assumed I was a Marine too, and if they ended up hurting a U.S. serviceman, there would be way more trouble for them than what it was worth. So, they just let me go. The gangster dude pretended like there had been some sort of mistake, even apologized to me as I limped out, telling me to come back soon with my friends. I'd never go back there, though. I know it's mostly just friendly business types giving the youngster tourists a fun experience abroad, but there are people down there who live and breathe violence and exploitation. I think that's what I want to say to any prospective travelers. Don't treat foreign countries like places you can't be hurt, or where actions don't have consequences, because as much as I like to think I did the right thing overall, I know it almost got the life beat out of me, or maybe even worse. I was 11 and living in the United States. My parents and I lived in a nice house in a nice neighborhood. One day, my dad noticed a lawn chair had been dragged through from our outer back garden to the front near my parents' window. The ceiling of the window had been almost completely removed as well. Basically, someone had meticulously taken the time to take the ceiling out in order to try to pop the window out. Turns out, the week prior, a neighbor's house had been broken into. At first, we chalked it up to someone trying to steal our shit. Over the next month or so, though, things like this kept happening on the regular, until eventually my mother was being driven so crazy by the idea of someone being this desperate and not getting caught that she ended up staying in the guest room near the front of the house with a golf club on hand at all times. The night we caught the fucker doing it is still so livid. I was up watching late night cartoons, as a lot of kids do, when my dog started growling so low and deep, it actually scared me. I'd never heard something so menacing before, and instantly I knew something was wrong. Every hair stood up on end at once. My dog was staring straight ahead at my window where the blinds were drawn, but it was as if he could see someone right through them. Next thing I know, I heard my mom scream at the top of her lungs, Caught you now, fucker. As any smart 11-year-old would, I ran out of my room as quick as lightning to see my mother bursting out the front door and chasing some guy down our little suburban street with her golf club. Unfortunately, the guy was too quick and got away. The police were called, and within the next 20 minutes, the guy was in the back of a police cruiser. My mom was called out to identify him, and as she confirmed he was the right guy, 
The officer who had entered his name into whatever system they used turned to his colleague and said, Registered sex offender here. I was old enough to know what that meant. My mom did her research the next day and found the guy's name and history. Turns out he was in jail for previously attacking a 12-year-old girl. The guy wasn't just trying to steal our possessions. He wanted to steal me. She later spoke to a friend who lived three streets away from us. Turns out she'd been given the piece of paper that said he'd moved into their vicinity. The entire experience is quite surreal to me. All those what-ifs hung around for a while. We didn't let the bad vibes get to us too much, though, since the guy had been thrown back in jail pretty soon after. I've since had a few similar things happen to me, i.e. a guy following me home when I was 14, and hanging around outside the front door until my mom turned up, so I can't say I've had great luck with creeps in my life. I'm glad, though, that they didn't get anywhere, so there's that at least. 